drug control programs with a focus on cutbacks at state and local levels. This is almost three hours. Subcommittee will come to order. <coughs> Good afternoon. I thank you all for coming. This hearing is part of a series of oversight hearings regarding the President's budget proposals for drug control programs and will focus on the President's proposed changes in this area. The administration released its budget proposal for all federal programs for fiscal year 2007 in February. One of the most significant policies <clears throat> reflected in the budget is a proposal to cut most federal support for state and local drug enforcement. Among other things, the administration has proposed terminating the state formula grants portion of the burn grants to state and local law enforcement, reducing funding for the HIDA program, and transferring remaining funds to the Justice Department's Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, OZF program. Cutting the Meth Hotspots program, administered by the Justice Department's Community Oriented Policing Services, COPS office, by more than 30 percent, and reducing funding for the Counter Drug Technology Assessment Center, CTAC, by 70 percent, while completely eliminating the Technology Transfer Program. The subcommittee shares some of the administration's concern about the potential of excessive or misdirected federal support to local agencies. Congress must be uh, careful not to make state and local agencies too dependent on federal dollars as these agencies must remain under the control and responsive to the need of state and local taxpayers. State and local governments have a responsibility to fund their own counter narco efforts as well. Yet it does not follow that all federal assistance to state and local agencies lacks national impact. State and local law enforcement our personnel are fighting on the front lines in the struggle to stop drug trafficking. They make over 90 percent of drug-related arrests and seizures and have a wealth of intelligence that should be very valuable if shared with federal authorities. Federal assistance to these agencies can have a major positive impact by involving them in the national goals of enforcement, treatment, and prevention. The goal of these proposals was, is, and always should be to maximize the efforts of federal and state and local law, local law enforcement narcotics efforts through mutual cooperation. It was not to uh, have one dominate the other. We hope at this hearing to address these broader issues and to review the administration's specific proposals for certain key programs. First among them is the HIDA program. This program was created in 1990 to help reduce the nation's overall supply of illegal drugs by bringing them together, federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies in the most significant regions, each referred to as a HIDA, where drugs are created, smuggled, or distributed. Under current law, the director of ONDCP may designate certain areas as HIDAs, making them eligible for federal funding. That funding is administered locally by an executive board made up of equal representation of federal agencies on one side and state and local agencies on the other. As the budget program's budget has grown from only $25 million at its inception to $227 million in fiscal year 2006, the number of designated regions has grown as well. From the initial five HIDAs in 1990, the program expanded to 28 HIDAs, and the pressure remains in Congress to create even more of them. By the way, one of the major reasons that pressure occurred is because of the administration's lack of response on meth, and most of the new HIDAs had to deal with meth, and what looked like an attempt by Congress to expand the number of HIDAs was actually because of the lack of response in how to address the meth problem. The administration has come up with two proposals, one to cut the program's budget from the fiscal year 2006 enacted level of $227 million to $208 million, two to transfer the HIDA program from ONDCP to the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, uh, OSADEF, a Department of Justice program. If enacted, this latter proposal would effectively terminate the current HIDA program. First, the program cannot and should not be transferred in whole or in part to OSADEF without authorizing legislation. Such legislation is needed to define the goals of the program and means of its implementation. Secondly, the subcommittee is troubled by the serious disruption of drug enforcement activities and the individual HIDAs that this sweeping proposal would create, at least in the short term. It would be most inadvisable for the federal government to take action that drives away state and local cooperation. And as we heard last year, they fully intend to completely withdraw. Today's hearing will also review the CTAC program, which was established in 1990 to oversee and coordinate the federal government's anti-drug research and development. The administration is requesting only $9.6 million for the CTAC program, a steep decline from the $30 million requested for fiscal year 2006 and the $29.7 million appropriated by Congress. The proposed decreases would cut the research program from $14 million to $9.6 million while completely eliminating the technology transfer program. The program is certainly in need of uh, direction 
and oversight. ONDCP has not yet demonstrated that the technology transfer program supports national goals in reducing overall drug trafficking and improving interagency communication and cooperation. Such dramatic cuts, however, do not amount to reform. As with HIDA, the subcommittee intends to review the CTAC program and its future as it continues its oversight of ONDCP. The subcommittee has concerns about the proposed reduction in the COPS meth hotspots dedicated to law enforcement activities against methamphetamine trafficking. Methamphetamine abuse has ravaged communities across the United States and put severe strains on state and local law enforcement agencies forced to uh, find clandestine drug labs, clean up the environmental damage they create, and arrest the drug traffickers who operate them. To assist these overburdened agencies, Congress approved $52.6 million in fiscal year 2005 and $63.6 million in fiscal year 2006, once again because the administration wasn't taking any action. The administration is requesting only $40.1 million for fiscal year 2007, a cut of more than 30 percent from appropriated funds for 2006. This would greatly reduce the ability of the state and local law enforcement agencies to help their federal partners in reducing methamphetamine abuse, particularly given the proposal over, proposed overall reduction in state and local law enforcement assistance grants. The subcommittee also has serious concerns about the administration proposal to terminate the state grants component of the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice uh, Assistance Grant Program. Congress already complied with the administration's request to consolidate previously separate grant programs into the single Byrne Grants Program. The administration now proposes to eliminate $416.5 million that Congress appropriated last year for the Byrne Grants and to restrict federal aid to a series of enumerated grants, most of which are previously existing programs, under a justice assistance account. In practice, this will sharply limit the amount of money available to help state and local agencies. We have quite a mix of witnesses with us today. We would especially like to welcome all the representatives of federal, state, and local law enforcement community who are joining us from the Department of Justice on our first panel, we will hear from Regina Schofield, Assistant Attorney General at the Office of Justice Programs, who will discuss the Byrne Grants, COPS, and other similar justice assistance programs. Stuart Nash, Associate Deputy Attorney General and Director of OSADEF, who will discuss the proposed transfer and restructuring of the HIDA program. Also from Scott Burns, ONDCP, Deputy Director for State and Local Affairs. Appreciate all of the uh, state and local representatives who are with us on the second panel. Coming in today, we'll again welcome Ron Brooks, President of the National Narcotics Officers Association Coalition and Director of the Northern California HIDA, Tom Carr, the Director of the Washington Baltimore HIDA, Tom Donahue, Director of the Chicago HIDA, Abraham Azam, Director of the Southeast Michigan HIDA, and John Burke, Director of the Southwest Ohio Regional Drug Task Force, SWORD. Before we get started, I would also like to note that congratulations are in order for one of our witnesses. We got word last week that Tom Carr's wife recently gave birth to a baby boy, Taggart Hunter Carr. That's wonderful news. We're all happy for you and your family. Again, we thank you all for coming from so many places across the country to be here today. Look forward to your testimony. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I too want to congratulate my good friend Tom Carr. And, um, you know, uh, Tom, the, uh, I think it was Frost who said, uh, Robert Frost says that every time a child is born, it's God's affirmation that the world should continue. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to thank you for holding today's very important hearing on the President's budget request for several vital law enforcement programs that contribute to the National Drug Control Strategy. A policy brief prepared last year by Conable Associates offered the following analysis of the President's FY 2006 drug, drug budget. And it said, the administration's proposed budget of $12.4 billion for drug control for FY 2006 portends major changes in federal drug control policy. The request increases funding for overseas programs to curb the flow of drugs from abroad and enhances border control. It also proposes a net decline in funding for demand reduction programs reduces or eliminates certain state and local law enforcement programs, and shifts more responsibility for local drug control to a state and local government partners. To its credit, the Congress largely rejected the approach outlined in the President's budget last year. But the administration proposes more of the same for fiscal year 2007. The President's FY 2007 drug budget would further shift the emphasis from demand reduction 
to supply reduction, and it repeats several proposals that would sharply undermine state and local drug enforcement efforts and federal, state, local partnerships. The FY 2007 request devotes 35.5 percent to demand reduction and 64.5 percent to supply reduction. By comparison, the federal, federal government spent 47 percent and 53 percent for these functions, respectively, in 2001. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I have been a vocal advocate for expanding access to drug treatment because we have proof that it works, not just in reducing and curtailing drug use, but in decreasing all of the negative consequences of drug abuse and the drug trade, including violent crime. The President's budget neglects prevention and treatment in favor of supply reduction programs that have yet to demonstrate a sustained impact on the availability of drugs on United States streets. Even within the category of supply reduction, there has been a marked shift in the proportion of funds devoted to efforts beyond U.S. borders as compared to programs that support effective cooperation among federal, state, and local law enforcement within our borders. Overall, the request would increase funding for interdiction and international supply reduction programs by 7.1 percent and 12.6 percent, respectively, while support for domestic law enforcement would increase by just 1.6 percent. One of my major concerns involves the President's proposal for the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program, presently administered by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. I'm most disappointed that the President's, President's FY 2007 budget restates last year's proposal to move the HIDA program out of ONDCP to the Justice Department under the control of the Organized Crime and Drug Enforcement Task Force program. I thought we sent a very clear message last year, and it seems as if we have to continue to send that message. Whereas the FY 2006 budget proposed to cut HIDA funding by $128 million, more than half, by the way, the FY 2007 proposes a relatively modest $16.4 million decrease. Still, this would allow, at best, for level funding for all HIDAs while eliminating discretionary funds to respond to urgent threats. However, there has been no indication from Justice concerning how it plans to allocate funding among the HIDAs. In fact, we have yet to hear from Justice uh, that moving HIDA there would be wise or even desirable from its point of view. I remain troubled that the 2006 strategy, while stating that the intent of the proposed move is to refocus the program, provides no explanation of how this change will make the program more effective and efficient. To date, there has been no assurance from ONDCP or justice that the HIDA program, if moved, would retain the unique characteristics that enable it to foster effective peer-level partnerships among participating federal, state, and local agencies. In 2005, a bipartisan coalition of members joined the National HIDA Directors Association in strongly opposing last year's proposal, and this year's proposal has already been received, it has already received a similar response from those who know the program best. I'm glad that we will hear today from several HIDA directors, including Mr. Tom Carr, who supervises the Baltimore Washington, or Washington Baltimore HIDA, an organization that makes such a vital contribution to drug enforcement efforts in and beyond my congressional district in Maryland, and one who, which has done an outstanding job, and one that, like many other HIDAs, HIDAs have brought state, local, and federal officials together to effectively and efficiently fight drug trafficking. 
Apart from HIDA, the President proposes to cut ONDCP's funding of the Counter Drug Technology Assessment Center by $20.1 million. The 68 percent decrease from FY 2007 appropriated amounts reflects the proposed elimination of CTAC's technology transfer program, which provides state and local law enforcement agencies with valuable equipment and training for deployments and operations. The President's request also repeats last year's proposal to eliminate or reduce funding for key drug control programs within the Department of Justice that support federal, state, and local cooperation. The request proposes to eliminate the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program, which allows states and local governments to support a broad range of activities to prevent and control crime and to improve the criminal justice system. The President proposes a more than one-third reduction in funding for the COPS Meth Hotspots Program, which allocates money for problem-oriented policing to combat the use and distribution of meth labs, including child endangerment programs, enforcement, drug courts, training, and treatment. Like last year, the administration proposes to reduce funding for the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, mobile enforcement teams, uh, through which DEA provides assistance to state and local law enforcement to address small toxic labs operating throughout the country and to eliminate the DEA's demand reduction program. Funding for the National Alliance for Model State Drug Laws also would be eliminated under the President's request. Mr. Chairman, in my view, the President's plan to eliminate or scale back these vital programs raises serious questions about the depth of the Administration's commitment to reducing domestic demand for illegal drugs and supporting state and local drug enforcement efforts. Open to question is how vigorously ONDCP, as the primary shaper of federal drug control policy, has asserted its budget certification authority to defend and support programs that advance all three pillars of the national drug control strategy. And finally, today's hearing provides an opportunity to question administration officials and some of the nation's most dedicated and knowledgeable law enforcement professionals concerning the policy decisions and priorities reflected in the President's FY 2007 drug control budget about how data and performance effectiveness measures uh, inform those decisions and priorities, and about whether the President's FY 2007 budget adequately supports the President's three-pillared strategy. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank the of all of our uh, speakers and guests for being with us today, and I look forward to their testimony. With that, I yield back. Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this most important hearing on funding one of the key components of our nation's fight against crime and drugs. Adequate funding for essential programs within the Department of Justice is part of the many steps this Congress must take in helping eliminate danger on our streets. Drugs are the root cause of a significant amount of crime nationwide. Funding efforts to eliminate drug trafficking and use should be at the forefront of our national agenda. Unfortunately, the President's budget for FY 2007 eliminates many important youth violence and gang prevention programs among the casualties of funding for the burn grants intended to help state and local law enforcement control violent and drug-related crimes, funding for community-oriented policing programs that provide temporary grants to local police departments to hire additional officers, funding for juvenile accountability block grants intended to help states and localities improve their juvenile justice system, and funding for programs designed to reintegrate youthful offenders into their communities. This is dangerously short-sighted. How are we to address the growing threat of youth and gang violence when the President's budget removes most of the federal government's gang and drug prevention programs? 
In my own county, Los Angeles County, the use of semi-automatic handguns in gang-related killings has quadrupled, and a National League of Cities survey concluded that 72 percent of school violence is attributed to gang activity, and I have a gun shop right in the middle of my district in walking distance from a local middle school that is out of compliance and they just received the permit to continue to sell the guns. They're operating illegal and they've been there 15 years. And uh, I am very, very concerned about that because where you have guns and ammunition, you have drugs, and that will start a decline in the community. You go away 10 to 20 years and that community will be annihilated. So in its most disturbing manifestation, the reach of gangs and crime has just not become national, but international in scope. We all must be on guard and concerned by these disturbing trends in crime and drugs. And so I want to thank again the chair, and I want to thank those sitting at the table for your willingness to come and testify in order for all of us to understand the dire need for the primary tools of our drug control and crime prevention policy to be adequately funded. This subcommittee will do everything in its power, I know, to help you get and those others out there the proper funding to fight the rampant <coughs> crime problems in these United States. So I want you to please continue your diligent efforts to remove this detrimental activities from our communities, and I yield back. And again, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ruppersberger. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, again, thank you uh, and Mr. Cummings. Uh, I wish more people in Congress would focus on this uh, drug narcotics issue as you do, too. Thanks for your leadership. Uh, I agree with the chairman that the federal dollars uh, must not be wasted and that the federal dollars that are used for these purposes are used to supplement, not replace, state and local funding sources. Uh, just like last year, we're here once again discussing the administration's plan to cut or eliminate most federal support for state and local enforcement efforts. Now, I also believe that for the programs that have demonstrated their worth, shown to be effective and serve local and uh, national priorities, these programs should be continued. In order to address deficiencies in any of these programs, redesigning or reforming the program should be the first option before cutting or dismantling. In hearing after hearing, we have heard from HIDA personnel that the program is successful and that drastically reducing the funds for this program and moving it to the Department of Justice will do irre irrevocable damage to state and local law enforcement counter drugs efforts. I'm still not convinced by the argument that cutting HIDA funding and moving what's left to the Department of Justice will be better at keeping drugs off the street that we are doing right now. And again, like last year, the administration was to cut all the funding for the Burn Grants program. These grants are vital to state and local law enforcement agencies. The drug war will always be fought at the local level on our city streets and suburban neighborhoods and in rural communities. The, this grant program encourages cooperation at all levels and allows communities to develop unique solutions to their own unique set of problems. Um, now, in my old days, when I was a lot younger, I was an investigative prosecutor. I did, I did a lot of drug work, and we found it to be most effective when we could have federal, state, and local working as a team and having the sources that we work, but getting the money from the federal government because we found in most situations that it just wasn't within one jurisdiction. It was, it was throughout the country, and, and I think it's a big mistake. Another issue that I'm very much concerned with, and I'll say it here, it might not be as relevant, is the issue of terrorism. We have to deal with the issue of terrorism. I'm on the Intelligence Committee. I probably know as much as anybody about how serious that is. But we are taking monies and resources away from drugs, and it's going to hurt us. Uh, you know, 85 percent of all violent crime is drug-related, and we have to keep our focus and keep our eye on the ball and keep the resources coming to the state and local if we're going to be effective in, in our battle against drugs. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for the hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Before I do that, though, before I yield, uh, I do want to acknowledge Tom Carr, Director of uh, Hyde at Washington, Baltimore. I have to go to another hearing now, but I won't be able to hear his testimony, but you got to
acknowledge your locals. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his uh, <clears throat> tremendous interest in this subject. Uh, I ask and ask consent that all members have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions for the hearing record and that any answers to written questions provided by the witnesses also be included in the record without objection. So ordered, I also ask and ask consent that all exhibits, documents, and other materials referred to by the members and the witnesses may be included in the hearing record and that all members be permitted to revise and extend the remarks without objection is so ordered. Our first panel is composed of the Honorable Regina Schofield, Assistant Attorney General, Office of Justice Programs at the U.S. Department of Justice, Honorable Stuart Nash, Associate Deputy Attorney General and Director of the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force at the U.S. Department of Justice, and the Honorable Scott Burns, Deputy Director for State and Local Affairs at the Office of National Drug Control Policy. So as, our, as an oversight committee, it's our standard practice to ask witnesses to testify under oath. So if you'll stand and raise your right hand. You swear the testimony I give today is the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll be back. Let the record show that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. Uh, thank you for coming, and we'll uh, start with uh, Ms. Schofield. Thank you. Mr. Chair and Mr. Cummins and Ms. Watson, I'm Regina Schofield, the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Programs. I am pleased to be here this afternoon on behalf of the Attorney General the U.S. Department of Justice and especially the Office of Justice Programs to discuss the President's FY07 drug control budget and his larger budget request. Through my work at the Department of Health and Human Services, I learned of the devastating impact of substance abuse on our children, family, and communities. My time at OJP has reinforced that understanding. I want to assure the committee that I, the subcommittee, that I share its commitment to eliminate illegal drugs and drug abuse. I realize that much of the subcommittee's focus today is on the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant Program, or JAG. As you're aware, the President's budget does not include funding for JAG, consistent with our FY 2006 request. I recognize the concern that this raises among members of Congress, law enforcement, and other interested parties. The decision to eliminate JAG was not made lightly. Given the current fiscal limitations we are all facing, and the need to focus our resources on combating terrorism. The choice we made, while difficult, was necessary. I ask that the JAG decision be looked at with the understanding that the program represents less than 1 percent of the funding spent by state and local governments on law enforcement. The decision should also be examined in the context of our overall budget request. We have asked for over $1.2 billion in discretionary grant assistance to state and local governments including $66.6 .6 million to strengthen our communities through programs providing services such as drug treatment. We would target those resources toward programs where we believe they can have the greatest impact. We have requested $69.1 million to our Drug Court Discretionary Grant Program, which is a $59.3 million increase over the FY06 level. Drug courts use the power of the court to effectively integrate substance abuse treatment mandatory drug testing, sanctions and incentives, and transitional services for nonviolent substance abusing, abusing offenders. Our FY07 request would allow us to provide funding for more than 100 drug courts, which includes starting new drug courts and improving existing ones. Our request will also provide training for hundreds more drug courts. I have included many other examples from our budget request in my written testimony, which I ask be submitted for the record. In our budget request, we have also targeted initiatives that allow us to work together with state and local law enforcement to make the most of our limited resources, not just by working harder, but by working smarter. Our Regional Information Sharing Systems Program, or RISC, helps local police, working with state and federal partners, identify and share criminal intelligence. We currently have more than 7,300 member RISC agencies nationwide. The training and technical assistance we provide is another way to make an impact with limited dollars. Training and technical assistance builds knowledge and expands capacity in the field. They can also be the key to helping states and localities leverage or even save limited training dollars. This year, OJP will develop a National Drug Endangered Children Resource Center, which will provide critical information on the federal government, 
states, and local communities on how to best help children that have been hurt by drugs, including methamphetamine. We also support the Center for Task Force Training, or CENTAF, which provides training to law enforcement on drug task force management and investigative techniques. In response to law enforcement demand, we more than tripled the number of meth training courses offered nationwide during 2004 and 2005 for a total of up to 12 courses. Working together with state and local law enforcement, we've developed performance measures to gauge the effectiveness of drug task forces. This was done through a partnership with the National Narcotics Officers Coalitions Association. The new performance measures will not only help state and local law enforcement evaluate these task forces, but also help us to plan and operate them more effectively. The coalition is one of many, many law enforcement organizations with which we have a close relationship. We are also in constant contact with state and local law enforcement agencies so that we can help them do their jobs more effectively. The administration, and specifically the Department of Justice, share a commitment with our state and local law enforcement partners to making America's communities safe and secure. Both our current activities and our FY07 proposed budget reflect these priorities. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today, and I would welcome the opportunity to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Nash. Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of Congress, I am pleased to appear before you today. Before I proceed, I want to thank this subcommittee for its strong commitment to oversight of the drug, nation's drug enforcement efforts. As you know, the President's budget request proposes transferring the HIDA program from the Office of National Drug Control Policy to the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice views the President's proposal as a tremendous opportunity for DOJ and HIDA to forge an enduring and productive partnership. In our view, HIDA's ability to marshal the skills and intelligence of federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies and to coordinate those efforts in a manner conducive to the law enforcement landscape in particular areas of the country has led to important successes in the drug enforcement field. The transfer of HIDA to the Department of Justice would allow both HIDA and DOJ to pursue drug enforcement more effectively. The transfer would permit more comprehensive coordination, enhanced deconfliction, more extensive intelligence sharing, and more effective strategic planning between HIDA initiatives and the drug enforcement efforts being pursued by the Department of Justice. Several misconceptions have arisen as to what the President's proposal entails. First and foremost, the President's proposal is not a proposal to merge the HIDA program with OCDEF. OCDEF, as you know, is the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Forces program, and it is the centerpiece of DOJ's drug control efforts. OCDEF is charged with coordinating all the elements of the federal government involved in drug enforcement, including DOJ, the Department of Treasury, and the Department of Homeland Security, in concerted efforts against the largest national and international drug trafficking and money laundering organizations. If the HIDA program were to be transferred to DOJ, DOJ has committed that HIDA would be administered as a freestanding program, completely independent of OCDEF. In this connection, I think it is necessary to explain my own status as a witness here today. I am director of the OCDEF program. However, I'm also an associate deputy attorney general, serving on the deputy attorney general's staff and advising him on all matters related to counter narcotics and asset forfeiture policy. It is in that second role that I am here testifying today on behalf of Deputy Attorney General Paul McNulty as his counter narcotics policy advisor. The fact that I also happen to be the director of OCDEF should not be taken as any kind of signal that, contrary to our specific representations, OCDEF would somehow be involved in DOJ's management of the HIDA program. Another misconception regarding the President's proposal is, if granted management of HIDA, that the Department of Justice would impose rigid, centralized controls over the program, depriving the individual HIDAs of their ability to tailor their operations to the needs of their specific geographic areas. DOJ recognizes that HIDA is specifically designed to allow state and local law enforcement to participate equally with federal agencies in defining the local drug threats and to craft localized solutions to combat those threats. Decentralized decision-making is woven into the very makeup of the HIDA program. 
Finally, there's a misconception that DOJ would use its stewardship of the HIDA program to unfairly direct HIDA assets to benefit drug enforcement activities pursued by the DOJ components to the exclusion of the state and locals. <coughs> However, DOJ has committed to the bedrock principle that federal agencies on the one hand and state and local agencies on the other should have an equal voice in managing their individual HIDAs. DOJ appreciates as clearly as anyone how counterproductive it would be for us to alienate our state and local partners, or for that matter, our non-justice federal partners, thereby losing their invaluable contributions to the shared enterprise of drug enforcement. Mr. Chairman, as you are aware, in February, Mr. McNulty came to Capitol Hill to meet with you on this issue. Later that month, he met and spoke with the HIDA directors at their annual conference, outlining his commitment to the HIDA program. Mr. McNulty followed this meeting with an individual letter to each of the HIDA directors, requesting any input they might have on this topic, and he and members of his staff, including me, have continued meeting with HIDA leadership, state and local law enforcement, and congressional staff to get their views on this issue. Based on our initial meetings, the department has developed, a cert has developed certain fundamental principles that will guide DOJ's administration of the HIDA program. Among these are HIDA will remain as a separate program within the department with its own budget and an independent management structure. HIDA executive boards will retain equal representation between federal agencies and state and local law enforcement. Assuming passage of the President's fiscal year 2007 budget request, DOJ will, will retain all of the existing 28 HIDAs. Each HIDA executive board will retain discretion to make its own funding decisions regarding the resources allocated to it. In closing, I want to emphasize that the Department believes that the HIDA program is a valuable tool in our nation's efforts to investigate and prosecute drug traffickers. The Department will continue to strongly support the HIDA program and will work with its leadership to develop new initiatives to vigorously enforce our nation's drug laws. Thank you for your attention to this important issue and the opportunity to testify here today and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Mr. Burns. Uh, Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today in support of the President's fiscal year 2007 national drug control budget. I want to thank the subcommittee for its strong bipartisan commitment to our shared national goal of reducing drug use in America, especially among our youth. You have inquired about the fact that for 2007, the budget proposes transferring the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, or HIDA program, currently operated by the Office of National Drug Control Policy uh, to the Department of Justice. The administration's basis for this transfer is to ensure better coordination with the Organized Crime and Drug Enforcement Task Force and the Department of Justice's many other drug enforcement efforts. That's where DEA is, that's where FBI is, that's where the U.S. Marshals, and Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the National uh, Drug uh, Intelligence Center, NDIC. The administration believes that the Department of Justice's management and oversight of the program will ensure that we are fully utilizing all resources and programs to their fullest potential to achieve the common goal of market disruption for illegal drugs. The administration will preserve important elements of the program, such as intelligence sharing and fostering multi-agency and multi-jurisdictional law enforcement coordination among federal, state, and local agencies and officials. The Department of Justice has ensured that it will make certain that the HIDA program plays a key role in our nation's drug enforcement efforts, particularly those involving coordination with state and local departments. Uh, and do that in a manner that complements the activities of other existing programs and of individual agencies involved in drug enforcement. The 2007 budget proposes $207.6 million for HIDA as a distinct activity within the Department of Justice. And as was mentioned uh, earlier by you, Mr. Chairman, and Ranking Member Cummings, that's level funding. Uh, I would concur with uh, the Department of Justice statement by Mr. Nash in the written testimony that the HIDA program is clearly a valuable tool in our nation's efforts to investigate and prosecute drug traffickers. And in closing, uh, I know that you have covered many aspects of the President's FY07 Federal Drug Control Budget with the Office of National Drug Control Policy Director, John Walters, uh, but I think that it's important to note that the President's 2007 Drug Control Budget request 
is $12.6 billion. That's an increase of $80.6 million over FY 2006 uh, enacted level. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and look forward to answering any questions you or other members of the committee may have. I thank you all. Let me uh, start with a, a, f a few general comments uh, that, um, that this subcommittee has jurisdiction over the Department of Justice as a whole and uh, obviously our primary focus because it was a choice of uh, the leadership to to make this this committee um, uh, a drug committee because it was divided up into so many different ones uh, and uh, similarly um, that was why we created the Office of the National Drug Control Policy that at some point uh, and I, I, I want to make sure I state this on the record I am I, I am a strong believer in OSADEF. OSADEF has done a great job in its tasks. I believe that the drug courts have been a phenomenal impact at the local level and something we look, need to look at expanding. I believe that Bureau of Justice Assistance uh, in looking at, for example, in, in my district uh, for uh, the number of people coming out of prisons is overwhelming certain neighborhoods and the ability to try to reach these people while they're in prison, try to do the transition out, most of whom, by the way, are there for drug and alcohol uh, related reasons. But as they come back in, if we didn't have these kind of programs to figure out how we're going to deal with it, I don't know what, what we would do. This isn't about the, the other pro programs. What we're focused here right now is more directly on the uh, narcotics efforts, some of which overlap and some of which don't overlap. So, um, uh, and let me also say, it's not about individuals. Uh, let me be real honest. Um, as the only remaining, uh, uh, I shouldn't speak for Mr. Cummings, let's just say on the Senate side, every major anti-drug person has already asked for the resignation of the drug czar. And I have not done so at this point, but my frustration is high. And I know many others in the House have they've tried to bring forth a resolution to do that. Um, and uh, thus far, I, I, don't, I don't think the President really cares. Uh, but I'm, I'm saying this directly. I don't have a problem with Attorney General Gonzalez running a lot of these programs. He actually spoke up first on meth. He's been articulate. This isn't about individuals. Paul McNulty has been a friend of mine for many years. I can't think of another individual that I would more trust running a program than Paul McNulty. McNulty. He is a wonderful guy. We, we worked with this. This is about structure. And one of my questions to, to Mr. Nash is, do you know why we created the Office of National Drug Control Policy? Do you know why we created a drug czar? Yes, sir, I do. I, I do, and, I, and, I, and I'm very sensitive to the concerns, and, and I think it was a, 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 a well-conceived notion at the time that it was taken, and it remains a well-conceived notion. It is very important to have someone uh, who has uh, the president's ear and, and who has the bully pulpit to, to make sure the drug enforcement remains front and center in, in the national attention. Um, I, I think that uh, consistent with that, however, it, and consistent with the president's proposal is the notion that uh, that shop is, is within the office of the White House. It, it, it is uh, a policy shop and the, the types of, of programs that that office runs uh, are programs that are different in nature than the HIDA program. They are not law enforcement uh, operations, and it is somewhat anom anomalous to have a law enforcement operation being run out of the White House, whereas at the Department of Justice, that's what we do. And I think that there would be significant benefits to be gained by moving this law enforcement program uh, into the Department of Justice and allowing uh, people with law enforcement background like uh, Mr. McNulty, as you acknowledged, who, uh, to, to take control of a number of these assets and to align them so that they are all engaged in a, in a non-duplicative, effective fashion. And, and I think that's what motivates the President's proposal here. I can't uh, tell you how much I uh, tell you how much I appreciate that answer because it's a, a straightforward answer about that I believe actually reflects much of what's going on b behind the scenes, and uh, uh, I want to make clear that I'm putting some words in your mouth that you did not intend. But let me 
kind of give a interpretation of what you just said, and then you can disagree because I don't think you're going to like the way I interpret it. Um, your statement today gives more guidance as to how you would uh, do the uh, restructuring of the HIDA, and I appreciate some attempts in there to clarify. But this clearly was driven by, by uh, something beyond uh, a frustration with the HIDA because to date, Nobody in private or public uh, statements have been willing to say a HIDA that they don't think is working well. They haven't really, other than that it's somehow going to streamline the relationship. But when I ask both informally and publicly, oh, you mean the Attorney General's office doesn't coordinate with the drugs are? You mean you don't coordinate with the uh, uh, HIDAs now? Nobody, oh, no, no, everything's, so we, we cooperate now. Then how would you cooperate more? Uh, you mean you're, there are things you could do to cooperate with the current HIDAs that you're not currently doing? Uh, nobody wants to, to say that. Uh, that um, uh, this is driven by policy decisions beyond uh, what, what's immediately in front of us. One is budget, uh, because if it isn't isolated uh, as part uh, where we can see it on narcotics directly, it gets much harder for us to sort out what's with narcotics. But the second is a philosophical position. And the philosophical position behind what you just said is a change of what the Drug Czar's office was intended to be by Congress, who drew it up, over the objections of the administration in the first place, not the current president, but long before this. And the, the concept of, of Congress was not was to give the Drug Czar direct control over some programs, rather than to sit in some building room in the executive office building giving his opinions and being ignored by the Secretary of State, ignored by the Secretary of Defense, ignored by the Attorney General, ignored by the President because he didn't have any actual money or people to mobilize. That's why we created the Drug Czar's office, that, that we already know that the Drug Czar isn't being, in my opinion, a very effective advocate for uh, many of the policy decisions that are being made. We have yet to identify any kind of programmatic decision that he's objected to, and, and Dr. Rice, Secretary Rice, or Secretary Rumsfeld goes, oh yeah, you're right, we actually do need to deploy more things on, on heroin in Afghanistan. We actually do need to do this down in Colombia because he isn't treated with, with the respect even now with all this behind him. Taking Haida out roughly takes, uh, I think it's what, close to 50% of the dollars of the agency as far other than their immediate staff. Then the CTAC is being reduced dramatically, which is another big chunk of the budget, which leaves the media campaign, which at best is shaky grounds here. And I know from talking to Director Walters, he somehow thinks this is going to strengthen the media campaign. Congress is furious that the media campaign hasn't been focused more on meth. And unless it's focused more on meth, it's going to be cut again and maybe disappear. So there won't be any reason to have any drug czar's office if we take all these things out. But the honesty of your statement, which is, by the way, not dissimilar to some of the other types of things as we tried to move through the faith-based office question and, and its, its direct control, is a philosophy of the administration. The administration does not have a right by fiat to change policies that aren't authorized by Congress. This proposal is dead on arrival as long as I am here and as long as the Republicans are in the majority and I'm here. And I can assure you from Senator Biden that he has no intention whatsoever should the Democrats take over in the Senate. And I think you heard from our colleagues here in the House that their goal here isn't to gut the drug czar's office. This proposal is a waste of everybody's time it is a waste of any kind of staff time you have developing it. It isn't going to happen. What we need to do is figure out how to make the HIDAs more effective to integrate. If there's an integration problem, let's deal with the integration problem with the Department of Justice. This isn't just about the Department of Justice. This is about the Department of Homeland Security and how you're going to integrate with the Border Patrol and the, the Coast Guard and ICE. This is about the State Department and how you integrate uh, their efforts and, and uh, that uh, satellite information and the JADIS and all this, this isn't just about the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice does a terrific job. And there was a fundamental question, should we have a drug czar or should we make the DEA in effect the drug czar's office? Should everything run in DEA? But because so many departments, the Agriculture Department gets into to research and spraying, the National Forest Service has much of the marijuana on their grounds. It doesn't make sense to consolidate all this 
joint type efforts, you yourself in your testimony, which is very good on showing the different HIDAs and what they do, show that this isn't much of what they do isn't even in your domain. It's partly in your domain. Without the U.S. attorneys, without the prosecutors, this would, wouldn't work. Without DEA, it wouldn't work. But it's also in other people's domain. That's why we created the Drug Czar's Office. And the budget this year is a direct assault on that, which then gets underneath the, the, the assault on state and local cooperation. Because to try to entice their dollars in, we didn't say everything had to be national or that the national was going to be national goals. We tried to adjust this sharing. Furthermore, many of us warned about the COPS program, that locals were going to get too dependent on the federal dollars. But as a practical matter, because uh, often we as Republicans at every level don't want to raise taxes, what happened in the narcotics efforts is, is that the burn grants and, and the uh, HIDA are the last remaining frontiers of where the local law enforcement is funding their narcotics operations. Only 1% of their budget, but it may be 80% of their narcotics budget. Now we're faced with the reality in front of us. If we wipe out this budget, there will be no narcotics task forces. There will be nobody putting their money into the HIDAs, and we won't have a narcotics program. Then the national efforts that are so important to, to OSADEF, to Panama Express, and all those groups, if your locals pull out of the stuff, Nobody's going to be making the street arrests with which us to make the federal cases. Uh, that, that we have a potential house of cards, this is going to go like and, and that's why in Congress there's such a pushback, not because of the individuals involved, not because of, of uh, that we have an argument with the Justice Department, which we overall think is doing a good job. We have frustrations with the drug czar's office. Uh, we have, have frustrations with the general thrust of it. But some of it, which is what we've deeply felt from the time, uh, and I have been a strong supporter of this administration, but almost from the word go, there was an, first a movement afoot to take the drug czar's office down from cabinet level status. There was objection when we put in the OCD, OC, NDCP reauthorization that it had to have, because we can't, we can't do that, only the administration can, but suggested that it should be treated that way and the administration tried to take it out of our OSADEF uh, bill, I mean our ONDCP bill, that there is a, a, a lack of fundamental uh, awareness of what, why we have this office and our concern that we're going to go, uh, uh, narcotics are going to remain a core challenge in this country. And we're going to go chasing off on different types of terrorism, we're going to go chasing off on bird flu, we're going to chasing off on church burnings, we're going to be chasing off on ch missing children, and, and that's what the Attorney General has a wide sweeping thing. The DEA and the, the Drug Czar's Office are the two things that their focus is narcotics. And if we weaken that office, we will weaken the narcotics efforts. Would you like to make any uh, comments? I didn't mean to mis misstate that, but I felt that you articulated what is in fact the administration's uh, concerns. I, I obviously can't, uh, in the time frame, respond to each and every one of your points. I would like to pick out one one of your points, however, and address it because I don't want my own comments to be misconstrued. And that is, uh, in in focusing on coordination between Haida and the Department of Justice, I don't want to leave the impression that Haida. Uh, uh, presents a special case and that it is more difficult for the Department of Justice to coordinate with Haida than it is for the Department of Justice to coordinate with the Department of State or the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of Treasury or, or, or any of the other federal departments that have a piece of the drug enforcement mission. Um, the, the fact is that the, the coordination of drug, multifaceted drug enforcement uh, investigations that span state jurisdictional boundaries that span international jurisdictional boundaries are, is one of the more difficult tasks that confronts modern law enforcement. And, and to the extent that anything can be done to lower barriers to that coordination, uh, it, it, it's a, the Department of Justice's viewpoint that that, that should be done. And, and that in, is one of the things motivating this proposal is that in our experience, it clearly is easier to coordinate uh, parts of an investigation when the, when the two entities being coordinated are housed within the same shop. And, and so the same thing that makes Haida effective, which is co-located uh, 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 state and locals from, from various police departments and federal agencies sitting together in the same place working cases in conjunction with one another, 
the, that motivation that, that, that makes that work and, and, and it, it caused us to bring them together in that environment. Uh, that argument also makes sense in, in, in taking Haida and, and folding it, excuse me, folding it into uh, a more uh, uh, central place in our view uh, in, in domestic so, law enforcement So maybe efforts. the southwest border should go under DHS, uh, the San Diego should go under DHS because it's a uh, lot on border in Haida. Uh, I mean, if the principle is where they overlap the most, Justice Department isn't necessarily where you would put it. That's how we got into the whole concept of drugs are in the beginning. The, the, the Department of Justice uh, does have the, the federal mission for domestic law enforcement. And, and from that perspective, it certainly makes sense that the HIDA program reside in our view because it is a wonderful program and because you know we, we would be foolish to, to look a gift horse in the mouth. We, we certainly would love to be associated with that program and, and, and to take advantage of those resources. Um, if there is, is some sentiment that uh, uh, that the HIDA program should be designed as a border protection uh, uh, resource, uh, then, then then certainly the, the Congress should should look to the Department of Homeland Security. But but as presently constituted as a a, a law enforcement entity designed to uh, uh, aid the coordination between state and local and federal law enforcement, in our view, the Department of Justice is the appropriate well, place Well, you, you touched on another sore point, and that is the Department of Homeland Security is also supposed to be doing narcotics enforcement, and that would include at the border, inside the border, uh, and elsewhere. ICE, if they do not view part of their mission, which is one of the things we had a concern about, the administration separated carnal narcotics out from terrorism, and our staff learned that. Uh, the, Department, the Homeland Security Committee, of which I'm part, has changed that under law, but that suggested another concern there, which is the administration's lack of understanding the link in, in terrorism, uh, immigration, and narcotics. But I'll, I'll yield to Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, to Mr. Uh, Burns, Director Walters uh, gave us a number of assur assurances when he uh, first came to us uh, as a nominee. And those assurances included a, a very strong commitment uh, to support demand reduction programs uh, and HIDA. Uh, President Bush, uh, then Governor Bush, personally pledged his commitment to HIDA during his, his first presidential campaign. For everyone involved with the HIDA program, it appears, you know, we're beginning to feel a bit of betrayal with regard to the commitment to HIDA, uh, because these proposals would pretty much um, terminate the program as we know it, as we know it. Uh, what considerations have led the administration to reverse course with respect to HIDA? And I do see it as a reversal. Well, I wasn't here. Uh, Congressman, Mr. Walters was confirmed. I'm not privy to statements or discussions or negotiations you or others had with him. Okay, but how long How long have you been with the department? Since 2002. Okay, well, I mean, it, you know what's happened over the last few years. Yes. And this, some of this things I'm talking about are things that are more recent and have happened since you've yes, been there. Yes, sir. So we can, let's just separate since you weren't back there during the nominating process and talk about this evolution of how we got here today as far as Haida is concerned from your standpoint. From my standpoint, I don't believe that anyone could not recognize uh, the effectiveness of Haida, uh, its ability to bring federal, state and local law enforcement together. If you take into account that 93 percent of all law enforcement in this country is state and local and 7 percent uh, is federal, clearly if we're going to coordinate efforts in this country uh, with respect to uh, reducing uh, the flow and, and the demand and, and thus addiction uh, to illegal drugs, there has to be a cooperative effort between federal, state and local. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Nash's uh, statement, which is the same that is in uh, my opening statement, is is that the, this administration believes, and it may be a policy dispute, but this administration believes that the Office of National Drug Control Policy should be, first and foremost, 
a policy office and that uh, it ought not be running uh, operational programs. This is the only supply side operational program uh, that I'm aware of in the White House. And I don't want to speak uh, specifically for Director Walters, but I can tell you that he believes that it ought to be placed with other operational supply side uh, uh, agencies and offices, DEA, uh, FBI, uh, OCDEF, and that uh, there it, it will uh, be in a position to, to coordinate better. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I should have, because I didn't realize so and DCP was taking this same position. So that means a national media campaign should move too because it's operational? Well, it's, I, I said the only supply side operational program uh, that I'm aware of, that would be a prevention and education program. Should CTAC be moved? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Your supply, uh, the the uh, CTAC, the the, um, the the different things at local police that you propose to to reduce, should that program be moved out of your department? I, I would say that's consistent with the policy of this year's proposal of and, cutting and all of the technology transfer but aspect. But you would of move CTAC. that whole thing out of your department. Uh, I, th I think the nine million is research. So you, uh, why would you keep research and demand? but not supply. There, is there any precedence in the White House that you would run? Uh, I can't think of another White House agency that runs a national media campaign of any sort. If the principle is, is that you shouldn't be doing, uh, you should be policy and not running agencies, I, I assume that to be consistent, everything would be taken out except for the policy. You would, research is done by NIH. Research isn't managed in a White House policy shop. If you're arguing you're just a White House policy shop, which, by the way, you aren't. You're created by, by Congress. But your slippery slope you're on is that your other programs would fall under that same criteria. There aren't other White House policy shops that run research operations that manage it, that manage national media campaigns. I mean, this is a slippery slope you're on. I'm just telling you that the administration's position is that the HIDA program, in, in response to the question, is a supply side uh, operational law enforcement type program that this administration believes is better situated in the Department of Justice. Now, you, you understand that the HIDA directors have a whole different view of this, do you, do you not? Yes. And I know for a fact that you have a tremendous respect for these directors because you, you know that they, they are out there every day giving it everything they've got, sometimes going against very difficult circumstances. And uh, so you really believe in them, right? Yes. Uh, come on. Hang Absolutely. With me okay. And these are the folks who basically are on the ground. Would you say they are the ones who are pretty much dealing with these drug problems uh, almost face to face with the persons who are dealing in the drug drug trafficking, is that correct? Absolutely. And one of the things that the President says when he, he always talks about uh, giving due respect to those who are on the ground, and I'm not trying to be smart or anything, but I, it makes sense that if you've got people who are on the ground, who are dealing with it every day, uh, who are facing every day the very people that go out there not knowing into the streets and into the meth labs, not knowing whether they're going to come back to their families, they deal with that every day. And if they say, and you already said that you have a tremendous amount of respect for what they do, if they say they don't think this is a good idea, I mean, have you all taken that into consideration? You, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, just I'm, I'm just curious. And they're adamant. And I don't think they are just, just some little turf battle for them. They, they are very, very upset about this. And we up here, we're trying to hear all of it, but we're also trying to make sure that whatever we do in spending the taxpayers' dollars is done effectively and efficiently. So what we have on the one hand are the people who are on the ground saying, Congress uh, persons, I, I beg you not to put this under justice because we don't think that it will be, we'll, it'll be as effect effectively uh, run 
uh, if you do that. But on the other hand, we have the administration saying, uh, you know, we want to do it our way. And I guess what I'm getting to is who should we be listening to? Well, I have the utmost respect for each and every one of the 28 Hyde directors, 27 men in Mona Neal in North Dallas, Texas. Uh, they're not only my colleagues, uh, they are my friends. But, uh, Congressman, I'm here today on behalf of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. The President's uh, budget proposal and that of the directors is that this program is better situated in the Department of Justice where it's with like uh, federal operational programs and not in the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Of the directors of what? Not, not, not the HIDA directors. The HIDA directors. The HIDA directors believe that this ought to be under what? Where? Oh, no, the HIDA directors uh, in unanimity believe that it ought not be transferred to the Department of Justice. I'm just telling you that the President's budget proposal, and uh, I'm here on behalf and, and in support of that. And the, the, just the sure. record, because you said directors, you meant the okay. OMB directors, the ONDC directors, is that who you meant by directors? The President's directors. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, um, and I know that, I know that when you say that, you, you basically what you're saying is you're, you're coming uh, with the marching orders from the president. I, I got that piece pretty much, right? And from your, your direct, Director Walters, is that right? Yes, my okay. job as Deputy Director at the Office of National Drug Control Policy for State and Local Affairs is to support the president's budget. Right. Now, I guess what I'm asking you is, um, how did you get there? In other words, how did you all get, we've got on the one hand these folks who are saying, you know, this is not going to work. Begging and pleading, saying, Congress people, please don't let this go into justice. We love justice. Justice is wonderful. We respect them. That's what they're saying to us. But they're saying this will not work. Now, and we've got you saying what you're saying. And what all I'm trying to say to you is that we, we are like sort of in the middle here. We want to hear the president and, and pay, you know, due respect to, to, to the president. But we've also got folks that are like our constituents who are out on the street. And so I'm saying, how did, how did you all, did you all come together with the Hyder directors and say, look, this is what we think we ought to do. Did you get any input from them? Because what you are doing affects what they do every day. I, I'm just curious. And by, by the way, we had the same argument last year. See, that's the other piece. And so I was wondering in that year, well, first of all, did you do it before uh, for last year's budget? And then, then did you do it again for this year's budget, knowing, knowing that it was an issue? Yeah, and I think uh, Congress spoke last year, and whatever you do this year will be dispositive with respect to the issues. You have an administration that believes a program should be in justice. You have uh, what I believe is a successful program, the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program, with 28 of the finest law enforcement officers in the country saying it ought to remain uh, where it is. And you're right. We went through the same thing last year, and here we are again. Well, last year, you all recommended a 56 percent cut in funding for Hyde. Is that correct? That's correct. And this year, the proposal is substantially less of a cut. Can you explain to me why that is? In other words, why did you decide this year? Because you came in, came in with some strong arguments last year, 56 percent, let's do this cutting. And uh, you were trying to convince us that this was uh, what we should do. And now it's substantially less of a cut. I think, what, 16 point, what is it, 16.4? It's substantially less of a cut. So what's the difference between last year and this year? Well, I would say two things. One, the, the $207.6 is 
what the president has asked for the last three or four or five years. That's level funded. It would not be indicative of a cut from 228 million. That's supplemental money that the Congress has added to the president's budget request uh, each and every year. So the 207 uh, million point six number is is consistent with respect to 100 million last year, and now requesting, as we have in past years, the 207.6 million number. Uh, all I can say to you, uh, Congressman, is is we heard what you said last year. Uh, Congress believes in this program. Don't cut it. Here we are back at, at the level funded amount. Now, so you did, so you, what are you trying to tell me? You heard with the left ear that we said don't cut it, but you didn't hear with the right ear that we said don't put it in justice. <laughs> Is that a fair statement? Uh, look, it's, <laughs> it, it's a fundamental <laughs> difference of opinion between two branches of our government. All right, uh, the I got executive you. branch and the congressional branch. I just have two more questions, and I want to go to Ms. Ms. Uh, uh, Schofield. Ms. Schofield, can you describe the consultation that took place between ONDCP and the Justice Department concerning the President's proposal to eliminate the Burn Justice Assistance Grant Program? Mr. Cummins, I had no such discussion with ONDPC, and I'm not aware that there were discussions between OJP and ONDPC about the budget. So that would so you, it wouldn't surprise you if there were no discussions. All right. Can I ask a sure. question? Sure. I, I thought that the Justice Department was proposing it be a policy shop. I'm sorry. I thought the Justice Department position and the White House position was they wanted the drug czar to be a policy shop, where the drug czar was in charge of giving suggestions on the drug budget, and you're saying. You didn't consult him on that? No. What I am saying is I am not aware of any discussions. I got to OJP last June after being confirmed by the Senate and uh, inherited part of the 07 budget, but we had no discussions with ONDPC about our – Would you uh, uh, check with other people in the I Department of Justice? I certainly will, and I will let you know. And uh, as an oversight committee, we would like to know uh, – we're not going to get into arguments about the documents – was there substantive d discussions with ONDCP uh, about uh, the burn grants, that was the question. Yes, right? that's correct. That directly affect drug law enforcement because we heard under oath uh, that the administration position was as a drug czar's office shouldn't operate programs, they should be a policy shop. And if they're a policy shop and not talk to on policy, then what are they? I will, and I will let you know. Thank you very much. Mr. Nash, um, you seem to have a lot of faith that uh, if Haida is under justice, Haida is going to do just fine. Is that right? In other words, they'll do just as uh, great a job as they're doing right now. I, 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 mean, I think that's pretty much what you said. I'm not. No, if no, that's I, not what you believe, just say it. I, no, no. I, I, I do believe that they are an excellent program now. I, I do have uh, confidence that, that this proposal is designed to make them an even better program. And although they don't believe that it would make it a better program, the directors, that is. Uh, they have voiced that uh, opinion very strongly, yes, sir. So it's like, sort of like Big Brother says, this is good for you. Well, I will say, uh, as I tried to correct in, in my initial testimony, I do believe that much of the proposal uh, that the Haida directors have been responding to in the past was based on misconceptions as to what it would mean uh, if the depart if the if the program were moving to the Department of Justice. And what were the major misconceptions that you that it, I mean apparently you have some idea what you think they they were? Well, I, I do believe that the messaging and, and I'm not sure how this was interjected into the messaging, but the belief is that that the Haida program would be merged into the OCDEF program, and if not merged, it would be run like the OCDEF program. And, 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 mm -hmm. and the ba my, my, uh, uh, the, thr the thrust of my testimony was in the hopes of dispelling uh, uh, that notion. I think we, we do at the Department of Justice have an appreciation for what it is that makes the Haida a, a successful program and, and one that uh, should be preserved in, in in its current form if it were to move to the Department of Justice? Well, t I can tell you that I agree with the Chairman with regard to OSADEF. I think OSADEF does a, a great job. 
It has always been, uh, for as long as uh, chairman has been chairman and I've been ranking member, it's been a major concern of ours that we always were concerned, particularly after 9-11, that the whole idea of fighting the drug war uh, would take a, not a back seat, but would be maybe put in the trunk. Uh, and then the, the war on terrorism, which is very, very important, and all of us agree we've got to do it. But we did not want it to fall back into the trunk, so to speak. And I think one of the concerns is that when you, when moving it over to justice, because justice is dealing with so many things, and, you know, that it, it might be pushed back. That's one of the concerns. And it sounds to me, when I listen to your testimony, as if you're going to, the program basically would, would uh, be put under justice, and then the program would be basically kind of operate just like it's been operating. And so then the question becomes, then if it's going to do what it's been doing, and we're just kind of moving it over, then why do it? Uh, you know, I, and I've heard your testimony, but I, that, that's what really makes me wonder. And the reason why I'm so concerned about it is that if I'm the person who's on the ground and I'm, you know, putting my life on the line, and I say that I don't think this is going to work, then, you know, I, I would just hope that, um, and then, I, and I, not only that, but I've got the Congress saying, that we feel pretty comfortable with the way things are, that is, with, with uh, Haida not being under the Department of Ju uh, Justice, it seems to me that we would stop, just say, okay, okay, all right, okay, let's, let's do it that way and let it go forward. And so now we're going to have to go through this same exercise again, and I, can guarantee, and I can't guarantee you because I can't speak for the Congress, but there's a pretty good chance it'll come out the way it's been it came out last year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and I want to say that <coughs> I, I believe your statement did clarify some, as did Mr. McNulty's meeting with me. However, the misconception is that because last year, under oath, there were no assurances. There was nothing that was sent up to Congress. And therefore, we leaped to the assumption that since it was being put under OSADEF, and since OSADEF model didn't include participation, other, and in fact, I testified under oath relative to that. That's how the misconceptions occurred. It wasn't like we pulled them out of thin air. It's, there was nothing there. This is the first time we've seen any details in print. Uh, we did have some verbal conversations. It didn't change our minds, obviously, but at least it has some uh, uh, guidelines for the first time that we've ever seen in print. Yield to Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I'm listening very diligently as to the reason why Many of these programs were moved on the Justice Department so they could be better coordination. It does not work on the streets. And, you know, this is not the first hearing I've been in. I hear all these grandiose proposals and we're going to do this, that, and that. It does not work on the streets. And I'm wondering how do you evaluate success? How are you going to show that the move will make the programs more effective? Now, I'm going to throw out some thoughts, and whichever ones of you would like to answer, please do so. But um, the President's request repeats last year's proposal to eliminate or reduce funding for key drug control programs within the Department of Justice that support federal, state, and local cooperation. The President proposes a more than one-third reduction in the funding for the COPS Meth Hotspots Program, which allocates money for problem-oriented policing to combat the use and distribution of meth labs, including child endangerment programs, enforcement drug courts, training and treatment. On August 29th, I lost my 22-year-old niece, Sacramento, California, because of methamphetamine use once or twice. Uh, we identified a property 
where young people were going in, cooking up the ingredients and turning them into pills and selling them. This niece lived with me in Sacramento when I was in the Senate. We call and we cannot get law enforcement out because the county sheriff's office is short-handed. The people that report are intimidated, firebombed, air put out of their thing. I'm on the ground. I just lost a niece, 22 years old. So you can sit here and talk about the coordination at the same time you're cutting the abilities for the state, the counties, and the cities to enforce. And I don't hear a word about how you're going to evaluate these programs to see that when you reduce the dollars, the program is still effective. I don't understand that. When our cities and counties are hurting and our states are hurting and we're not putting money into COPS programs and meth is spreading out of control in the suburban areas. I lived in a most unlikely area for drug sales and drug use, but it's more prevalent in rural and suburban areas. And that ne means we need boots on the ground. And how do we do that when these programs are being cut? Would someone like to respond? Mr. Burns? Well, I'd rather defer to uh, the well, other whoever. two, but let, let, me just, let me just say this. First of all, um, I'm sorry for your tragic loss. Thank and, you. And I mean that. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, too. That's, that's terrible. Um, but, but you raise a, a number of important issues, and, and I know the chairman's time is tight, but we, we could be here all day, and I would love to do that and sit down with any of Just you. Just explain to me how you do it when you cut the budget for these programs locally. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you this. The overall president's request for this year is higher than last year. So when you say cut, it, it's a matter then of sitting down and making a determination with respect to, well, what got cut? Because if something got cut, something certainly got added. Drug courts last year were 10 million, 10 million. Uh, they are an effective program in this country. The proposal this year is 70 million. So there's been a $60 million uh, increase in the request from the president. Uh, methamphetamine labs have to be cleaned up in Sacramento and all across the country. Last year there was $20 million available for that. Uh, this year you. we've asked for a $20 million increase. Excuse so me, those are two examples of things that haven't been cut. I need you to yield for a moment. Okay. Is this not correct? The President proposes a more than one-third reduction in funding for the COPS Meth Hotspots Program. Is that true or not true? My understanding is that's, that's true. Okay, that's what I'm referring to. That's why I use the example of my niece, because it was methamphetamine that affected her heart and took her life. And so how do you explain to me that there's an increase somewhere? Well, because you've latched on to one program that was cut. Uh, yeah, there's, exactly. There's an additional 30 million in meth-specific treatment that's been requested. $30 million more to reach out to people in your community and across the country uh, to meet a need that, that everyone agrees was lacking. So there's been an increase in that. It is a fundamental decision by the administration to look at programs. There is a process in place to, to judge them, and we can all agree or disagree what the scorecard was. Mr. Burns? Yes. I mentioned one specific program that has been cut. Yes. And the result of cutting that program means there is less training of local police and treatment locally. And you can talk about all over the country. But when there is, of course, you can say it's an increase if you're talking about the whole country. <coughs> but when you cut so specifically in these programs, and I told you, we saw the lab, we can't even get it closed down. And so we're talking about hotspots and the money for these hotspots and to train law enforcement and to coordinate has been cut. So how can you say because there's more money 
nationally, but for this specific program, there is less. And we're seeing the negative results of less funding. So I don't understand your explanation of how you could cut this program and expect things to get better. Well, the general you yield? Yes. Um, did you say it was an increase from your budget request? I, I can't hear you. Did, <clears throat> did you say it was an increase from your budget request? My understanding is that the President's FY 2007 federal drug control budget is an increase over 2006. Federal? Drug control budget, yes. So you're saying you increased your proposal, which Congress actually increased more the previous year? Yes. So it's actually a reduction in what we spent last year? It is an increase over what was enacted in 2006. It is more, we are asking for more than you enacted last year, Congressman. Okay, we're, <clears throat> that, um, there certainly has been a, sh a shift. I'll, I'll yield back. That, <clears throat> Ms. Watson, did you have any further questions? I just wanted to say that uh, funding for the National Alliance for Model State Drug Laws would be eliminated under the President's request. And the proposed elimination and scaling back of vital demand reduction and domestic, domestic law enforcement programs raises serious questions about the depth of the administration's commitment to reducing domestic demand for illegal drugs and supports uh, supporting state and local drug enforcement agencies and efforts. And this is what I'm concerned about. On the ground, if we accommodate these requests and cut, we can't get the job done. It's not really attacking the problem. And uh, I'm trying to find out uh, how you think we can really address these issues without the kind of uh, resource supports uh, down to the local level? Well, my response without being uh, repetitive is, is twofold. One, these cuts haven't taken place yet or these changes. This is proposed for 2007. So as we sit here today, there has not been a one-third cut in, in uh, the program. Well, that's the budget we're working with. You know, the President proposes we advise and consent. That's right. So I'm raising, you're representing the administration. I'm raising the questions of tell me why the proposal would be made such as it is. Of course, we're going to work with it and we're going to do all we can to see that it does not go into force. But uh, you're sitting here and we're having a discussion right. and I just want to know what your thinking is and what your real commitment is if you want it to be successful and how you measure that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> let, me, let me ask this question again. You're saying that <clears throat> your total budget request is how much of an increase? Uh, was it 20 million? Is that what you said? Over an My understanding, Congressman, is that the President has asked for in 2007 drug control budget 12.6 billion and that is 80.6 million over what Congress enacted in 2006. So it's a uh, less than 1 percent. But the point being, if, if we're talking about cuts and, and how could you come before us with, well, with all of the, it makes the point that this president and this drug czar is as committed this year in overall funding uh, against this issue than what was enacted by Congress last year. We are asking for more than was enacted. It makes that simple point, nothing more. Well, we'll, we'll be uh, putting into the record. We, uh, we'll at least take some of the summaries. We submitted this report that went through the entire committee with additional views that all of us signed on. And um, it literally takes apart a whole bunch. For example, you didn't count the war supplemental funds previous year on Afghanistan and narcotics. We have disputes at how you reallocated and made changes in the DOD budget and how, what you allocated to narcotics. Um, that um, it doesn't uh, account for the fact that, um, uh, so we don't believe that the budget comparison is accurate. Uh, the second uh, point being is, is that we're also here arguing about shifts inside the budget that move from state and local assistance to federal, which is a policy question. It's true that the overall budget isn't being sh shifted by 40 percent. What's being done is 
dollars that were going to state and local, whether we get into safe and drug-free schools, which is a, another uh, argument that we've, we've had. The part that was going directly to the schools was being eliminated. The part that was in going to the federal was increased. And there's a philosophical shift in addition to a dispute about whether the total dollars are there. The way that uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security was being accounted, all of a sudden, arbitrarily, the administration decided to assign part of that into the narcotics budget. And that that is part of our frustration, even in matching oranges to oranges. Yield to Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I know that I missed most of the discussion Thanks. because I was someplace else talking about an ounce of prevention is worth much more than a pound of cure. And I'm just wondering, Mr. Burns, did I hear you mention the word uh, treatment in your response to, uh, to, to uh, Representative Watson? Yes, There sir. may have been some increase someplace and that maybe treatment would, would, would take care of some of the need that she was raising the issue about uh, my response, uh, Congressman Davis, was she asked me why a particular uh, program may be cut. And my response, and probably awkwardly, was to tell her that the administration, in weighing and grading and judging a number of programs, indeed recommends cuts of some, but then there are increases of others. And I gave her some examples of what has been increased. And I used the example of treatment, specifically methamphetamine treatment, uh, because uh, there, there has been a specific recommendation this year, in addition to the some 1.8 billion that goes toward treatment in this country, that uh, several million be directed specifically toward methamphetamine. All right, and so there is some increase in, in treatment resources um, that in terms of the overall problem should help with reduction. I would hope. I, let, me, let me then just ask the, the other one question that I really wanted to ask is, is, is how much coordination is there between the different approaches. I mean, is there an effort to seriously coordinate trafficking prevention, um, law enforcement with treatment? Uh, are there programs designed where we try and bring all of the entities together to kind of look at how effective are we really being dealing with all components at the same time? That's a great question. And, and the answer to that is the Office of National Drug Control Policy has not only tried to do that on a national level, uh, a state level, uh, a city level, but at state and local level. We have a, a major cities initiative, Congressman, where we go into Chicago. We go to Los Angeles, we go to Miami, and we say we need to coordinate. We need to coordinate prevention and education and treatment and law enforcement. Do we have a balance? Is too much being spent on one area and not another? How much are the cities putting in? Maybe the state isn't uh, uh, spending as much money uh, as it should or, or sharing its burden. And maybe the federal government has not looked at community coalitions or treatment modalities, uh, or that law enforcement needs some beefing up. So to answer your question, that's the crux of, of what we have been trying to do uh, with respect to coordination uh, across the country. Do we have the appropriate balance, and are we uh, funding and supplying the various programs uh, enough? Is the lead the same in each area? Are, are there different lead entities that, that might handle the coordinative effort? For example, could it perhaps be law enforcement in one area? Maybe somebody from the treatment community in a different area or prevention people in another area? Is, 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 is there any one model for that or are there different approaches based upon what might be taking place 
in different communities. Well, uh, Congressman Cummings uh, mentioned Big Brother. The last thing that we do at the White House is go to a city and tell them uh, what they need. We go there and ask them, because each city, as you know, is unique, what is the best model? And each one is different, and certainly in some cities, it's, pr it's the prevention uh, entities that are leading the way, and others, it's treatment. But I have to tell you, in the vast majority of the major cities in this country, it has been law enforcement that has stepped up and brought everyone together. Uh, uh, broken down barriers in some instances that have been there for a long time, and uh, uh, to that, uh, they have to receive credit. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Schofield, could, uh, does the Bureau of the Office of Justice Assistance, have you done some of the kind of coordinated things that Mr. Davis asked about? The Bureau of Justice Assistance under OJP? Yes. Yes. Um, it, it, going back to the discussion on drug courts uh, and adding to what Mr. Burns mentioned, that uh, the, re the original request in 07, 06 was actually $70 million for drug courts. We received a $10 million increase a $10 million, I'm sorry, amount from uh, the Congress. Uh, we have asked for $69 million this year, and that money actually would go toward treatment and prevention. Uh, drug courts have proven to be extremely successful. We're in the fourth year of a five-year intensive study. The first year that people have finished up on specifically with meth treatment, 83 percent of those people have been meth-free. The second year of the study has shown that 72 percent of them have been meth-free. And that is a success story that we would like to build upon and why we have asked for, asked for additional resources for drug courts. And I, and I want to say for the record, uh, first off, I'm, I've been willing to express my frustration. But I am pleased at the proposed uh, meth treatment part inside the treatment. It's not additional money, but it's a set aside for meth treatment because we didn't have enough programs. And, and Administrator Curry has been ex expanding those on the treatment side. This is another effort of the administration to try to address that on the treatment side. The drug courts where they are in areas where methamphetamine, either mom and pop Nazi labs or the crystal meth have been trying to work with it and, and we're making some progress. Uh, they, that as far as the dollars increase in treatment, it's mostly been in the faith-based initiative, which I support, but which Congress has been mixed on, and, uh, but it hasn't been an overall uh, major increase in, in treatment. But the administration has been steady in asking more for drug courts, and Congress has been willing to give, and that's a problem here in, in Congress. We don't like the Rob Peter to pay Paul, but the fact is, is that uh, we have to do some of those kind of things in the budget, and the drug court uh, is a place that has, has been strong uh, it can be easily over-exaggerated for its impact because this is tough stuff, You're, but at least we're making uh, measurable progress where people are getting drug tested and we are, uh, you have, if, if it's an effective program where, where the judges are overlooking the individuals and holding them accountable and the alternative is, is incarceration, it tends to be a stronger incentive than a lot of our other types of programs and has had a, a measurable impact on society and deserves the funding, and I want to thank you for that. One, one last uh, question. Uh, okay, uh, let me ask one more question, Ms. Schofield. Um, did, um, as you develop the Bureau of Justice Assistant programs like drug courts, have you personally had interaction with the Drug Czar's office? Yes, I have, sir. So in each of the different programs you have, a, uh, you ask them what they've been learning in the field and how it relates. Particularly in my Bureau of Justice Assistance, uh, we have been working with Mr. Burns personally on uh, regional conferences dealing with meth, and we look forward to uh, working with him continue. The first one, I believe, will be in August. Uh, we talked about it actually at the beginning of this session here today. Uh, OJP will be co-sponsoring those with ONDPC. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cummings? Yeah, just one other thing. I, uh, just uh, about, uh, I guess about three or four hours ago, a um, a reporter had asked me about, was asking me about meth, and he asked, well, do you feel that meth has received uh, a lot more attention than crack cocaine, heroin, uh, and cocaine? Uh, and I said, um, I think that they've all received quite a bit of attention, and I just, I want us to, to, you'll find no greater advocate of making sure that we deal with the meth problem than, than you're going to find sitting right here. But I also want to make sure that um, those problems that have been historically problems for my district and so many urban districts 
like crack cocaine, heroin, and cocaine, that we are addressing those vigorously. The drug court, what made me think about that is when the chairman was talking about the drug courts, uh, we found that the drug courts have been extremely uh, effective um, in, in Baltimore. Uh, but, and so I was very pleased to hear about that. That's, that's a good thing. But you, going back to you, Mr. Burns, when Mr. Uh, Davis asked you the question about the balance and making sure that thing, where, the, where, I mean, do you do things to make sure that everything is balanced, prevention, treatment, and whatever. You know, I couldn't help but think about the fact that, uh, like the Baltimore, Washington, Haida has all that within it, treatment, prevention, and uh, certainly the law enforcement piece. And so, uh, I guess, they, well, they'll testify a little bit later, but they have it, they have that balance in, within the Haida itself. And so, um, I think that we have to keep that balance because I got to tell you, I mean, while I, I do, I am concerned uh, about um, the supply side, I am very concerned about the folks who are using it and cutting down the demand side. Because I think we have, I think both are important, but I don't want us to get lost in the process and forget that there are a lot of people. If you call the convention of all the former drug addicts in Baltimore and those who are under treatment, you'd have a major convention. And so uh, that's all I wanted to say, and I want to thank you all. Thank you. Mr. Burns, I know this is kind of an odd um, uh, question that uh, is um, given the fact that you, the official administration position is you'd like to get rid of the HIDAs out of the drug czar's office. But have you ever had a discussion that the HIDAs were intended to deal with drug trafficking, and that's why they were law enforcement? And there's been an exemption, I think, for two HIDAs. But I've often wondered why the same model wasn't put together for prevention and treatment, where just like we have HIDAs for drug trafficking, we don't have similar pooling um, that uh, at the state level there have been efforts on uh, drug prevention and treatment separate from law enforcement. Why at the federal level haven't we tried to look at taking our efforts in drug-free schools, in drug treatment uh, under the multiple agencies there, our national ad campaign, and look at how can we, in regionalized as well as national, do something in prevention and treatment much like we're doing in drug trafficking. There, that when we start to merge them, sometimes you get, uh, you, you have a battle for where you put which. But to me, we haven't ever had this kind of concentrated local thing unless there is some kind of community effort like happened in my county where it, it pops up or in Cincinnati where it pops up. We have CADCA out there, the community anti-drug groups that would be logical to merge with this. Uh, SAD, MAD, um, uh, uh, PRIDE. Uh, all the, the DARE programs, all this kind of stuff. Have you ever even had an internal discussion to talk about uh, structuring that? I know you deal with it on an ad hoc basis, but where we would systematize and say, look, we're putting literally hundreds of millions of dollars into these things at the federal level. Why don't we look at how to do a model like HIDA? Well, Certainly, there are multidiscipline approaches uh, in, in, in states and in, in communities. And uh, again, with additional time, Mr. Chairman, I'd love to sit down and, and talk to you about this. Some people would say we do it now, we just don't call it anything. That certainly we coordinate federal block grant SAMHSA monies for, for treatment. And there are states and communities that come up with, uh, with monies for prevention and education. And somebody sits down with the chief of police and the sheriff in that town and they say we should have uh, a, a group and, and they get a community coalition uh, grant, 100000 a year for five years, and, and there it is. Uh, and that, that's happening across this, this big country we have, but we don't call it HIDA or we don't call it some uh, national treatment prevention effort, but, but, it, but it's something I would love to discuss with you more. Because they're co-located. One of the key things in HIDA is they're co-located. Correct. Uh, they, and, and the question would be, is it prevention and treatment if you had a, a regional representative, like in our state of Indiana, the dr governor's office has this, but you were co-located where you had somebody, not necessarily every day, it's a little different than drug trafficking, but you had a, had a regional center where you had 
the different major treatment people represented. You had the, the CADCA community person represented. You had the, anybody who was going out and doing drug education in the schools. Uh, if a drug treatment grant's coming in, if a uh, Department of Justice assistant grant's coming in for people coming out of prisons, because it, it does seem like a very ad hoc type of a basis when you actually get down into the, the, the weeds as, as, as I do. And I just don't believe we've had as an effective a focus of coordinating on prevention and treatment like we have on drug trafficking. And I don't want to, I'm the last one who wants to undermine the law enforcement where it's in effect working to be co-located. But I, I believe we haven't had the same focus. And I just wondered if that's been an internal discussion. Any other uh, questions of this panel? Thank you very much for your uh, patience. We're going to, I believe, have a vote before too long. So if we can get the next panel up, get sworn in, and see if we can get through the opening statements. Thank you for coming. I know it was a wonderful, uh, pleasant experience, but we, it's part of the oversight function to try to figure out uh, and work through our differences. Sorry, I didn't have my mic on there. Um, we appreciate you coming today uh, and look forward to your testimony. Each of you have been involved in this for a long time, bring lots of law enforcement experience and lots of interaction in multiple agencies, and we appreciate the opportunity to hear from you. We'll start with Mr. Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The 44 state associations and more than 62,000 law enforcement officers I represent as president of the National Narcotic Officers Association's coalition, are grateful for the continuing leadership that you, Congressman Cummings, and the Speaker of the House provide on this issue. <clears throat> as a police officer, you learn to live with risk and expect the danger. That's really our world. But what keeps me up at night is the death, fear, ruined lives that I've seen at the hands of addiction and violent crime. The present drug control budget takes law enforcement for granted. It recommends the elimination of the Burn Justice Assistant Grant and the transfer of HIDA to the Department of Justice. Mr. Chairman, you, Mr. Cummings, and your colleagues have stood by us for years. I'm asking the Congress to stand by us at this critical hour and not let this happen. Thanks to the vision and leadership provided by the United States Congress, there's good news in our fight against drug criminals. Significant reductions in overall drug use have been reported, and violent crime has fallen. But this budget proposes to kill the programs that have been instrumental in those successes. Drug abuse kills more than 28,000 Americans each year, and the impact on our economy is estimated to be $180 billion. Drug trafficking and abuse are the most significant and continuing threats to our domestic security. Since September 11th, no child on U.S. soil has been injured or killed in a foreign organized terrorist attack. But almost every child will be asked by friends or acquaintances to, to try dangerous illegal drugs. Unfortunately, too many will make the wrong choice. This budget request would tie the strong hand of state and local law enforcement behind its back, reducing support for multi-jurisdictional drug enforcement. Burn and Hide a Task Forces are the lifeblood of state and local drug enforcement, which make up 97 percent of all drug arrests, and they have demonstrated clear results. In 2004, Burn funded task forces responsible for, for seizing over 5,600 meth labs, 54,000 weapons, and massive quantities of narcotics and cash assets. These real quantifiable results indicate the power of using federal dollars to leverage state and local investment in public safety. The administration argues that the federal government has gotten too deep into funding state and local law enforcement activities, but I strongly disagree that Burn JAG and HIDA fall into this category. Minimal funding through Burn JAG leverages massive state and local investments in justice programs to enhance cooperation, build good cases, and pursue organizational targets. Drug trafficking is an interstate and international problem which calls for federal inve investment. 
The best way for the federal government to assist state and local law enforcement in targeting priority organizations is through multi-jurisdictional task forces. These task forces take full advantage of state and local intelligence and expertise, and they contribute to investigations of national and international drug trafficking organizations. The NNOAC is not alone in calling on Congress to recognize the importance of the Burn JAG program. Fifteen major organizations representing hundreds of thousands of public servants across this country joined us in signing a letter supporting full funding for the Burn JAG formula program and retention of the HIDA program at the Office of National Drug Control Policy. In addition to our concerns with Burn, the NNOAC strongly opposes the administration's proposed transfer of the HIDA program to justice. HIDAs are the single most effective collaborative partnership in the history of the criminal justice system. They have balanced governance and are administered through ONDCP, which is agency neutral. A transfer to justice would lead to a disintegration of those valuable partnerships. Mr. Chairman, ONDCP is a critical institution with a pivotal role in national security and drug policy. But it needs strong leadership, and that has been lacking. I cannot understand how this drug czar can support recommendations by OMB to dismantle the most effective state and local drug control programs in the nation. It reflects a lack of understanding of the importance of state and local law enforcement in the nation's drug control strategy. And it allows a disturbing pattern, including ONDCP burying its head in the sand on the methamphetamine issue, arbitrarily defunding our community prevention coalitions, and most recently being caught flat-footed by Mexican legislation to legalize drug possession. In our experience, only Deputy Director for State and Local Affairs, Mr. Scott Burns, has reached out to key stakeholders. But because of that lack of meaningful con consultation with drug enforcement by the Director and his staff, Representative Terry offered an amendment, which you supported, that directed ONDCP to consult with law enforcement in the development of drug control strategies. Mr. Chairman, our members are truly grateful for your recognition of the value of our expertise on this matter. Mr. Chairman, we're at a critical decision point. My colleagues and I have served and protected the public our entire careers. 18,000 of my brothers and sisters are now memorialized on a wall just down the street, including my partner who died in my arms after being shot by a marijuana trafficker, uh, and another partner whose hand I held as he died from complications from exposure to meth lab chemicals. We're united in our support for the Burn JAG program and retention of the HIDA at ONDCP. Mr. Chairman, let me just close by saying that our group knows that the true drug warriors in this country don't just wear vests or carry guns. Uh, our partners in the fight against drugs have been the members of this subcommittee that have taken a leadership role. Uh, our 62,000 members hold you, Mr. Cummings, and the members of this committee in very high regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of the committee, uh, I'm honored to appear before you today uh, to discuss the Hyde Director's concerns with the administration's FY07 budget proposal that contains what we believe to be unacceptable budget cuts for burn and justice assistance grant programs and the proposed transfer of the Hyde program to the Department of Justice. I come to you with over 35 years of law enforcement experience, including over 21 years of experience in drug law enforcement and policy development. Since its inception in, 19, in February 1994, I've had the honor to uh, serve as the director of the Washington Baltimore HIDA. Among my many duties as the HIDA director, I chaired the committee that developed the HIDA performance management process used nationwide in the HIDA program today to measure its efficiency and its effectiveness. On March 10, 2005, when I testified before this committee about the administration's FY06 budget proposal, you may recall that the Office of Management and Budget and the Office of National Drug Control Policy alleged that the HIDA program was inefficient and ineffective. I'm pleased to see that at least today these offices are not assailing the program with that flimsily supported charge. Mr. Souter, uh, Mr. Cummings, Ms. Watson, and members of the subcommittee, as you well know, the HIDA program was one of the most successful government programs in existence today. My fellow directors and I assert that a drug control program that yields a return on investment of $63 for every program dollar invested seizes $10.5 billion in, at least in illicit drugs at wholesale value, 
nearly a half a billion dollars in illegal drug assets or drug profits, dismantles and disrupts over 35 drug trafficking and money laundering organizations, destroys more than 4,500 clandestine drug laboratories capable of producing a minimum of $31 million worth of methamphetamine, and apprehends more than 12,000 fugitives, to mention only a few of its many accomplishments over a 12-month span, can hardly be thrown on the ash heap because it's not demonstrating results. Indeed, the HIDA program should be emulated, not emulated. At this time, I'd like to provide to you a copy of the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program 2004 Annual Report for the record, and I've provided that to the committee. This report details, as you well know, all the program's marvelous accomplishments for calendar year 2004. Our 2005 performance results will be published uh, this summer. However, I can tell you in advance that the program has already identified over 5,000 drug trafficking organizations, 491 money laundering organizations. Uh, of these, 1,600 or so were international, 15 multi, mul 1,500 multi-state, and 2,400 were local in scope. Uh, we've done over 429 RPOT investigations, and we've referred over 1,100 uh, DTOs to the OCDEF uh, program. Our HIDA initiatives have successfully dismantled 950 drug trafficking organizations and disrupted over 2,000. And by the way, I thought you'd be interested to know that Mexico is the principal source for the drugs being trafficked on our streets, according to our records. And based upon our information, it also appears that the largest single ethnic group involved in DTOs is Mexican. Our HIDA program was built on the premise that federal, state, and local agencies have an equal voice in managing the HIDA, uh, the individual HIDAs, and addressing the regional drug threats. Mr. Nash, whom, by the way, I truly admire for his commitment and dedication to helping resolve this nation's drug problems, spoke about the complications that would be res resolved by moving the HIDA program to the Department of Justice. I submit to you that these complications are in the minds of those vying for control of the HIDA program, not in the minds of those performing the day-to-day -day work of coordinating activities, deconflicting cases, exchanging intelligence and information, planning activities, and ultimately dismantling and disrupting drug trafficking organizations. It appears to have taken the Department of Justice some 15 years to recognize what, Mr. Chairman, you pointed out, that the HIDA program, with its emphasis on regional drug threats, links directly to the larger national and international aspects of the drug trade. HIDA's bottom-up approach to dismantling and disrupting drug trafficking organizations on the local, multi-state, and international levels has proven to be a most effective one, uh, as our performance caters, indicators have shown for the last two years. Mr. Nash and others at the DOJ assert it is, it is that is by moving the HIDA program to, do, to DOJ, HIDA would gain resources and become a stronger program. I have no doubt that in many ways this is true. My question is, why does it have to be moved to accomplish this? There is no reason that every benefit Mr. Nash cited cannot be afforded the program now. What prevents DOJ from coordinating activities, enhancing deconfliction services, sharing intelligence, and developing strategic plans that include the HIDA program? Mr. Nash stated that the HIDA program would remain an independent, freestanding program within the Department of Justice. It holds that status now within the Office of National Drug Control Policy. However, ONDCP is viewed by federal, state, and local law enforcement as a neutral authority. By that I mean ONDCP is not the beneficiary of funding. If moved to DOJ, justice agencies would have an upper hand when it comes to obtaining height of funds. State and local law enforcement no, would no longer have an equal footing with their federal counterparts on the Heidi executive boards when it came to devising strategies and obtaining funding. This fact would change and actually undermine the entire HIDA process. The Department of Justi Justice plan, and I'm glad to see this year they have a plan and have articulated one so that we can uh, uh, at least gain some attempt to understand it, really contains only one new element. The other, el other elements are already in place in the HIDA program. That new element, however, is very disconcerting to us. HIDAs have not seen a programmatic increase since 1998. Operating costs have steadily escalated, and our ability to conduct operations has already been placed in jeopardy. By reducing the baseline funding to HIDAs in order to create a competitive, 
discretionary fund. Task forces will by necessity have to be eliminated or severely reduced in every HIDA, regardless of their performance. The proposition was put forth that in order to achieve maximum impact, HIDAs will be encouraged to coordinate enforcement initiatives more closely with other department crime fighting initiatives, including Project Safe Neighborhoods, the Safe Streets Violent Gang Task Forces, the, and the OCDF program. In the Washington Baltimore Haida, Mr. Cummings, as you well know, we fund two Safe Street Task Forces. I sit on the Virginia Project Safe Streets Advisory Board, and Mr. Azam sits on a similar project in his Haida. And tomorrow, my Deputy Director and Program Manager for Intelligence are meeting with a regional OCDF coordinator to assist in developing a new strategy for targeting for OCDF. We are also in the process of, pure, of procuring a gang database compatible with that used by the FBI, ICE, and ATF for use by everyone in our Haida region. I can't imagine how we could achieve any more impact or any, any higher level of coordination than I just described for you. Mr. Nash astutely mentioned barriers to sharing intelligence that, and that these would be reduced when the Haida program is moved to the Department of Justice. Again, I submit to you that these barriers are artificial and in the minds of those vying for control of the program. Many high intelligence an analysts have top secret clearances. We have facilities approved to handle classified material. And most importantly, we have been and are willing to continue to share any and all information with the Department of Justice. It's the Department of Justice that has often been less than forthcoming. Let me close by saying that under Mr. McNulty's leadership, the Washington Baltimore Haida has prospered. I consider him a close friend. Personally, I have ever reason to believe that the Haida program would also prosper in justice now that he's the Deputy Attorney General. However, it just does not have to be moved to justice for this to occur. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the National Haida Directors Association, I thank you for the opportunity to speak for you to, uh, with you today and I look forward to responding to any questions you may have of me. Thank you. You may have been a little generous to call what was presented today a plan. It was an outline of a plan, at least, which is more than we had before. They called it a plan, but yes, sir, you're <laughs> correct. Mr. Donahue, thanks, thanks for coming again. Cummings, uh, Congresswoman Watson, I thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today. As you know, uh, we testified on the same problem in March of 2005. I predicted then that there would be an adverse impact on the Chicago Haida, and that has sadly come true. I predicted if the 2007 proposal is also passed, it will affect the Chicago Haida adversely. The Chicago Haida has ensured that law enforcement drug operations have consistent direction, follow policy guidelines, engage in strategic planning, and communicate across organizations and jurisdictions. These factors give law enforcement an advantage over criminals that would be difficult to achieve if working independently. HIDA initiatives have been instrumental in assisting law enforcement agencies with accessing an all-source counter-drug investigative support center and source of counter-drug intelligence products, including a heroin offender tracking base. They have uh, also been involved in disrupting distribution networks that supply organized street gangs in the greater Chicago metropolitan area. They continue to target numerous open-air drug markets operated by street gangs in Chicago, especially the heroin markets of the west side interdicting drug currency shipments via the highway system and government or private carriers, disrupting organizations involved in laundering illicit money from the drug trade and enabling the development of tax cases against these dealers. They're also involved in financial analysis directed at seizing assets acquired through illicit drug proceeds. They're involved in identifying the international sources of supply of drug trafficking groups that operate in the Chicago area. They also are instrumental in case and trial support as well as post-case seizure analysis. All of these activities speak to the comprehensive strategy that is required for intervening in drug crime. Each HIDA has developed a cohesive, comprehensive program combining regional and locally focused initiatives to implement the national mission of countering that drug threat. The drug problem in Chicago, in the Chicago area has increased dramatically over the past years. According to the Illinois Department of Human Services, uh, that dramatic increase in the number of people requesting treatment for heroin and cocaine abuse. The Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse noted that in 2005, there were over 38,000 admissions for heroin addiction and over 20,000 admissions for cocaine addiction. 
Heroin alone was a 54% increase from 2004. Since August of 2005, it has been discovered that we have another problem in Chicago. That is fentanyl, which has been distributed in the heroin markets in Chicago. Fentanyl is a Schedule II substance under the Controlled Substance Act. The drug has shown up as pseudo-heroin and also as an adulterant used with heroin. Fentanyl is a synthet synthetic opioid more than 100 times more potent than morphine or heroin. The use of this drug has left unsuspecting heroin abusers the victims of overdose and death. In the last year, there have been over 300 overdoses and over 40 deaths from the use of fentanyl. Ida clearly represents a model for leveraging all resources in order to provide comprehensive approaches for stopping the drug crime. The joint leadership of the Haida Executive Board has been instrumental in ensuring that law enforcement engages in strategic planning and coordination of efforts to disrupt drug markets, halt the proliferation of criminal networks, and reduce drug-related deaths. Without the ability to maintain the operational collaboration made possible by Haida resources, local law enforcement faces a risk of returning to the days when cooperation was episodic, delivered on a case-by-case -case basis, and found to be generally ineffective in disrupting drug trafficking. Under these circumstances, it will be impossible to maintain declining crime rates and prevent drug-related violence from again spiraling out of control. The Chicago Haida has proven to have an established and effective investigative support center. Since its inception, the Chicago Haida ISC has clearly defined the intelligence component for its enforcement initiatives. The Chicago Haida has lost focus due to the proposal from the 2006 budget in which the administration uh, asked to move the Haida uh, to ONDCP and cut its budget by 56 percent. As a result of that, I lost five very experienced analysts in my investigative reports support center. It wasn't until approximately a week ago that I was able to replace those individuals. And I can't blame them for what they did because of the unsurety of their future employment. The inability to provide quality work products due to heavy workloads and job insecurity has caused a great deal of stress and low morale in the ISC staff. The INC, ISC's intelligence program has had a solid reputation for novel methods to support law enforcement. The momentum from creativity and innovation has come to a screeching halt. During 2005, the ISC has had to turn down more than 40 local drug conspiracies, several federal wiretap investigations, and countless law enforcement inquiries. The intelligence element for the following multi-agency law enforcement initiatives has ended or has been severely compromised due to the lack of experienced analysts at the Chicago ISC, and they include our package interdiction team, domestic highway interdiction, the North Suburban Drug Units, the South Suburban Drug Units, our West Side Heroin Task Force, Drug-Related Violent Crimes Initiative, and our Money Laundering and Financial Crimes Initiative. Within the last year, agency intelligence systems and personnel are not being offered to the ISC by federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. The Chicago ISC has not been invited to participate with newly created intelligence groups such as the Illinois State Police Stick Center and Federal Fusion Centers due to the viewed lack of support in the HIDA program. Agencies do not want to commit to a program that may not exist in the future. Clearly, the lack of confidence in the HIDA program has undermined its purpose. Clearly, the President's 2007 budget would impair the HIDA program. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Azam. I always like to have him here so he can go, uh, young man, to, to me, because not that many people call me that anymore. But uh, those of you at this uh, uh, table here have so much more experience, and we really appreciate you coming, Mr. Azam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Abraham Azam, the Executive Director of the Michigan HIDEM. I have attached a professional biography of my law enforcement career and experience, <coughs> and that chronicles 49 years of anti-drug law enforcement. Our HIDEM has been in existence since 1997. We have an annual budget of only three and a quarter million dollars. We support 24 task forces with value-added assets. We have an investigative support center. That investigative support center provides deconfliction services and analytical support to the whole state of Michigan. And I've attached a brief description of the Michigan Hyde and its daily operations. I've also attached a breakdown of the 383 federal, state, and local law enforcement members in our task forces. And as you know, we have a 700-mile border with Canada, our good neighbors. The Michigan HIDA has been committed to the most important HIDA function, and that is simply coordinating and synchronizing federal, state, and local law enforcement. 
We have an animated and engaged executive board. Our HIDA provides that neutral and effective environment for all our law enforcement community to potentiate their multi-agency and multi-jurisdictional strengths. A most notable HIDA effect has been the creation of a mechanism for our state and local partners, the policemen out there, the road warriors, to interact and interface their valuable information with our federal partners. This has proven to be very valuable in our anti-terrorism efforts. You're aware of the events of 2005 and 2006 as, as, as regard to budgeting. These ill-conceived proposals had an actual operational posture on the Michigan Hydra. The first reaction was shock and disbelief that we were betrayed by our own parent agency. The next result was the destabilization of the Hydra infrastructure, similar to Mr. Donahue's. This was internally and externally. There was no hope that we would survive until the end of 2005. We fought hard and we relied upon our state and local assets and our legislators. Our federal partners expressed support of HIDA privately. Privately, they said, we're with you. Publicly, they were forced to be mute on the subject. And that detracted from their credibility with our state and local partners. Internally also, in spite of constant reassurance, I could see and detect the effects of the destabilization on our HIDA staff. The loyal and dedicated people that make a HIDA run, in my HIDA at least, include a finance manager who once managed a credit union. She's a single mother. She has two teenage children. I have an IT manager. He's a college graduate. He's got triplets. I have an administrative assistant, also a college grad, and a single mother of a teenager. And I have my deputy director. He's a former major in the US Army. He's been with me since we started. He and I constantly reassure and calm, calm our staff, asking them to trust us and trust the Congress to rectify this terrible and onerous mistake by ONDCP. And I leave it right on ONDCP. It would have been justified for any of them to leave the Michigan Hida for more stable employment. I'm proud to say they stayed. The executive board and law enforcement community were generally relieved and grateful to Congress for the relief you've given us in 2005. Now in 2006, on the first Monday of February, the incredible occurred. Mr. Walters and ONDCP are again proposing the disruption and destruction of the most effective law enforcement collaboration program in history. We do not understand how completely out of touch with reality Mr. Walters and his immediate staff have become. It seems as though the actions of the Congress in 2005 just didn't happen. ONDCP actions regarding the issuance of the performance program, policies and procedures, fiduciary issues, disregard of our threat assessments, uh, their reluctance to embrace the highway interdiction program, which has proven to be the most excellent anti-terrorism collective around these days, and a continued effort to move us out of ONDCP all seem to be aimed at circumventing the will of Congress and for no good reason that I can see. Haida's basic strength is, comes from the fact that it's neutral. It emanates from the National Drug Office of Drug Control Policy, from the President of the United States. It's been an asset that provides comfort to all the participants. It comes from the President's office. The U.S. Department of Justice is strong and professional, and they are part of our operation. But I fear it cannot provide the neutrality necessary to engender voluntary participation. The HIDA program must be regionally administered, equal and neutral. One of the problems that I have is that the HIDA program has some 52 intelligence operations, which are totally, absolutely disregarded by Homeland Security in their effort to stand fusion centers. The HIDA currently has the most in integrated intelligence function in the country. And if they would recognize us and join us, they could save millions. I will continue, sirs and madam, to continue to re reassure my staff that their careers are secure. They are looking to me and to you to do the right thing. 
I'll continue to reassure my law enforcement colleagues that Haida has a future. And I'm available for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Burke, we appreciate you uh, being our cleanup witness today. Good to see you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I was testified in the field hearing that you had in Wilmington, Ohio. Um, and if you remember, I was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So, um, I'm the commander of the, of the Greater Warren County Ohio Drug Task Force in Southwest Ohio, an agency that has received burn memorial and JAG funding for the past several years. In addition, I'm also the vice president of the Ohio Task Force Commanders Association. I represent the 36 drug task forces in the state of Ohio. And I'm jointly in charge, along with the FBI, of the Southwest Ohio Drug Task Force called SWORD, an initiative that is part of the Southern Ohio High Intensity Drug Trafficking Carry. And I've been a law enforcement officer, I thought for a long time, 38 years until I heard that he had been involved for 49. The illicit drug problem in the United States continues to plague our jurisdictions and the good citizens that we protect. These drugs are brought into our communities, usually from Mexico, into our southwest border states, and then transported by motor vehicle or shipped through a variety of commercial entities, including the U.S. Post Office. In addition, millions of illicit drugs, pharmaceuticals, are being smuggled into the United States from Mexico and Canada or shipped through freight handlers when citizens procure them through illegal Internet sites. These drugs then feed addictions and or provide a ready supply of pharmaceuticals for sale. Prescription drug addiction conservatively makes up 25 to 30 percent of the overall drug problem in America and in some states is causing more overdose deaths than their illicit counterparts. One thing I saw in the news this morning was that a terrorist group has apparently earned millions of dollars through counterfeit Viagra um, sales. Our region is also fighting a significant problem with the clandestine production of methamphetamine. Our labs have tripled from 2004 to 2005. Incredible resources of both manpower and money are being expended in order to fight the production of a drug that, in my opinion, is clearly the most addictive on the planet. We have been able to combine resources with our state investigative agency, local law enforcement, and the Drug Enforcement Administration to address this growing concern. However, as the problems of clandestine labs are handled, somewhat handled, the influx of ice or crystal methamphetamine from Mexico has already begun to infiltrate our region of the country. The Burn Memorial JAG grants. The reduction in Burn Memorial JAG grant funding in Ohio has been devastating over the past two years toward fighting the illegal drug problem. In calendar year 2006, we have seen a minimum of a 50 percent reduction in these funds available to our task forces, with calendar year 2007 promising at least another 50 percent cut. These cuts, if allowed to remain intact, will effectively eliminate a portion of the drug task forces in Ohio in 2007 and across the country and cripple many others who manage to continue to exist. In most cases, the region's drug task force is the only law enforcement agency working full time on prosecuting high level drug dealers. These task forces work in concert with state, local, and federal law enforcement groups in combating the illegal drug trade. Local officers oftentimes provide the manpower and the intelligence associated with their own communities. This is an invaluable asset to state and federal officers as the law enforcement entities pursue this problem together. Without the full reinstatement of Burn Memorial JAG grants to the states, the resources provided by local law enforcement will be greatly curtailed and in several instances eliminated altogether. High intensity drug trafficking area. Southern Ohio has become the newest addition to HIDAs in the United States. The Office of National Drug Control Policy funded program has already been highly effective in pursuing high level drug trafficking criminal enterprises in Southern Ohio. HIDA funds have provided our region with the ability to house local, state, and federal officers within the same office and work together on a daily basis pursuing national and international drug traffickers. In my office, which we call SWORD, we currently house agents. I currently have agents from the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation, along with several local law enforcement officers and administrative staff to conduct complex and sometimes lengthy drug investigations. To complement this effort, we also have a criminal analyst from the Ohio National Guard's Counter Drug Task Force who assists us in this endeavor. HIDA funds provide us the ability to aggressively pursue criminal enterprises that oftentimes are based near or outside the borders of the United States, most commonly Mexico. With HIDA funding, we have been able to pursue large drug trafficking rings, money launderers, and a violent murder for hire criminal coalition that yield multiple indictments in the fall of 2005. This unprecedented cooperation between local, state, and federal agencies has only been accomplished because of the existence of the Ohio HIDA. If funding were to be eliminated for this very important program, the cooperation between these agencies in most cases would return to the minimal levels that existed before HIDA's existence. If that happens, 
Only the criminal element that preys on our region will benefit. One last thing, the federal forfeiture, asset forfeiture, the restriction on federal forfeiture that does not allow enforcement to use the funds for current employees is in needs of revision. This unnecessary restriction oftentimes ties the hands of local drug task forces who may secure large amounts of federal forfeiture funds but cannot use them to support salaries of current employees. This can leave these task forces in the position of having multiple, having ample funds for equipment, overtime, and many other services, but being totally unable to pay for the salary of the investigator. In conclusion, this enormous job requires that these agencies work closely together. The local drug task forces receive ample funding for their own existence. This funding has been provided in the past through the Burn Memorial JAG grants, which have dwindled to only a fraction of the levels provided in calendar year 2005. Restoring this funding to at least 2005 levels is extremely important to our drug enforcement efforts. In over 38 years in law enforcement, I have not seen a program that better equips local, state, and federal officers to combat the illegal drug trade than HIDA. The successful joint law enforcement enterprise that HIDA has given my region of Ohio has been invaluable. As we continue to partner into more complex national and international drug smuggling operations that would have been impossible without this federally funded program. Local and state law enforcement needs the financial resources assistance available from the federal government in order to combat, combat the drug problem. Although we see the problems at the local level, they are the aftermath of national and international drug trafficking that can only be deterred through multiple agency cooperation fueled by consistent and thoughtful funding. I want to thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Uh Brooks, first let me thank you for all the help you've provided to our committee over the years, our subcommittee. Um, and as a, a business major, um, I mean, one of the first things you do is you, you, when you're managing something, you try to learn from your customers, from people who work for you, and, and, and that type of thing. And especially in this case, since Congressman Terry uh, we worked on the, the floor to pass through the House of Representatives, basically unanimously, that they ought to consult uh, at ONDCP uh, with uh, the HIDA directors, with local law enforcement before they make these kind of proposals. So I just wondered, since it's be good management procedure and since uh, clearly it was the will of Congress, how did the meetings go? Uh, well, <clears throat> you know, there's only really three organizations that represent America's narcotic officers. Can you turn your mic on? There's only three organizations that represent America's narcotic officers. Mine, which represents 62,000, the National HIDA Directors Association, which represents our directors, the National Alliance of State Drug Enforcement Agencies, which represent the heads of each of the 50 uh, state drug enforcement groups. Um, I am in constant contact with the other two groups, and I, of course, manage my own group. We have never had a meeting uh, to date on uh, the outcome of the HIDA program, on whether burn JAG should be funded, on the newly released uh, methamphetamine uh, synthetic drug plan, uh, on the about to be released Southwest Drug uh, Border Drug Plan, on the National uh, Drug Control Strategy, or on other issues that might affect us, such as what's going on in Afghanistan, the issue of mi microherbicides and how it affects the domestic supply, the issue of how we interact with the community anti drug coalitions, the Drug Free School Act, uh, the National Alliance of Model State Drug Laws, and the list goes on and on. Uh, the Office of National Drug Control Policy is an absolute critical office if we are to ever get a handle on the drug problem in America. The leadership there is critical, uh, and uh, from a symbolic nature, we need a cabinet officer with direct access to the president and the ability to call cabinet meetings and the ability to interact uh, with each of the concerned agencies and the ability to interact directly with you and the Congress. Uh, we need that office, and the office is critical. And I would never suggest for a minute uh, that I think that, that we shouldn't have that office and that it shouldn't have cabinet status. But I will suggest that this office has never once, uh, under this administration, under, under the administration of Director Walters, has never once stepped up, has never called a constituent meeting, uh, has never brought us together for consultation, nor has it provided the leadership that our members had expected when we vigorously supported his confirmation in 2001. Mr. Donahue and Mr. Azam, uh, Azam uh, both testified that the mere discussion about dismantling the Hyde is 
had discouraged your staff, had resulted in, in the case of Chicago, a number of people leaving and coming back. Were those local law enforcement agencies that thought it was marginal and they had tight budgets? Is that? No, it was basically the federal law enforcement. Uh, other DEA oh, DNA is our biggest supporter. But once the federal uh, law enforcement agencies uh, determined that we were going to be in, in a sinking ship, uh, most of their resources went off to Homeland Security. The, um, most of you have had a long time in law enforcement. Do you get, uh, first, what was your reaction to the idea that the Drug Czar's Office should be a, a policy shop and not administer things, that they should sit around and discuss things? Uh, uh, and then the second comment, which is kind of a loaded question, I'll give you a second loaded question. Um, do you get the impression sometimes, as, as people have been out in the field for a long time, that if this is a policy shop and they haven't talked to you, um, uh, that it's a lot of young people sitting around in Washington talking about a theory and none of them have actually done it? I think that's evident by uh, the current uh, administration and the immediate staff. Uh, there is no one in that uh, capacity that has any prior experience in law enforcement. Mr. Azam. And I haven't seen a comprehensive strategy coming out of ONDCP in the last three years. There is no strategy. There is one, there is one other thing about our, our staffs. Uh, the same thing's happening in Detroit and Chicago. The federal agencies are slaves to their, their organizations, and they look upon us, oh, you're going to justice, the money's going away. And our state and local partners continually tell us on a private basis, you've got to stay neutral, you've got to stay neutral. This is very simple, sir. I feel like an athlete with a coach who won't call a play. And I'm part of a team, an excellent team. We're all sitting around, and those in ONDCP who do call plays are, are negated. They're put in neutral immediately. It's very, uh, difficult. It's very difficult for all of us directors. The, uh, I don't have the, your uh, background, as, but as I recall, you were uh, DEA for me. Yes, sir. For You're hardly years. hostile to the Department of Justice. I am not at all hostile. To, I learned my skills from the Department of Justice. I did 25 years with DEA. I achieved a very high status with that organization. I was a deputy assistant administrator for international operations for three years and ended my career as executive assistant to the administrator and deputy administrator. And uh, I was there when, when President Reagan called for his drug advisor, this is Admiral Dan Murphy of the Navy. And he came to the conclusion that there were some 135 or probably more now at the time agencies that had something to do with the anti-drug effort and it was totally uncoordinated. As a matter of fact, I, I was at a meeting at DEA headquarters when Admiral Murphy in frustration stood up and said, if I had to fight a war the way I'm getting information from you, I'd probably lose. And s this was in like eight, 1982. It was several years later that the Congress enacted the Anti-Drug Abuse Act and created the office of ONDCP. And the fact is there are too many agencies out there. Each one is an excellent agency, as is Justice, as is Treasury, State Department. All of them have a mission and they have a strength. It took ONDCP and the office of the director to coordinate all those efforts, to bring it together and eliminate the stovepiping. Thank you. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Chairman, it's been a long day and I will be very brief. Um, first of all, I want to um, thank all of you for what you do. Um, I've often said that it is a, indeed a very thin blue line, and it is thin. And I think so often we take so much for granted, but I just want to take time out on behalf of all of us to thank you for holding on and holding out. Um, one of the things that I think I, I love so much about Haida is the coordination and trying to make sure that you pull all of the, the local, the state and federal folk together so that you can use our resources effectively. Um, it just seems to make sense to me. Um, uh, Mr. Azan, you were saying a moment ago that there was a time when things seemed like they were really kind of separate, and, but Haida was able to do that. Would you say that that's probably one of the greatest 
things that Haida does that is pull the pull the folks together. Absolutely, coordinating and synchronizing. No doubt about it. No doubt in my mind, sir. And Mr. Carr, I think it was, or Mr. Brooks, one of you all was going down. I think it was you, Mr. Carr. All the accomplishments of Haida, um, and. I guess without that coordination, you wouldn't have been able to, to make that statement, would you? No, sir. That's what Haida's are all about. The whole, the whole uh, I guess you could say the gimmick behind Haida, the game behind Haida, is getting state and local and federal uh, agencies, whether it's law enforcement, in our case, treatment and prevention, to come together to the same table to see their common commonalities, to see what their common goals and objectives are, and work together to obtain them. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. Does it does it surprise you all that um, you all heard the testimony a little bit earlier from ONDCP? I wanted to make sure, first of all, that you all were respected, and that was clear that you are respected by ONDCP. But are you surprised that you're not? Folks are not sitting down with you and saying, "Okay, we're all in this boat together. We we are fighting a very difficult." enemy or enemies and let's see how we can really sit down and not be talking about each other but talking to each other I mean are you are you all surprised by that I, if, I, I think we all have our own opinions I'm no longer surprised uh, we're frustrated to the nth degree uh, for example uh, we know we have the model for sharing information and yet, as Mr. Azam pointed out, we're frustrated by the fact that no one's touting that model to Homeland Security. And so we're wasting millions of dollars nationwide because now other uh, departments in the government are going around creating another stovepipe intelligence center. We're frustrated because we're not included in developing mess strategies when, in fact, we're the ones that develop those mess strategies that are being used. We're frustrated because we're not included in developing a uh, strategy for the southwest border that's being revised, employed and now revised again because all of a sudden the National Guard involves involved in it. So we're frustrated by all of, all of this. The, the, I, th I think that the ONDCP in many ways treats policy as alchemy and, and, and they don't include the partners that should be included and they don't consider the timeliness of when they should include it. If you're going to develop a national uh, drug control strategy and include input from state and locals, you start to do that in, in January and February for a document that's going to be published the following January. You don't wait till November of the uh, two months before it's going to be published. Yeah. Congressman, if I might yes, answer your question, uh, nothing does surprise me. However, I am surprised that within a year's time we've turned from an ineffective program that should be abolished to one of the most wonderful law enforcement programs in the history of the United States. I, I wonder how that could be and if it is so, why would you take a star uh, away from your organization and, and to, to coin your phrase, put it in the trunk? Mm. Yeah, Mr. Brooks. Mr. Cummings, could, if I could also the, the national drug control policy, there was a, the national drug control strategy, there was a time prior to Director Walters when they would hold national focus groups, uh, bring the constituent groups together for robust discussions. Uh, I can remember vividly sitting together and working long hours to help develop that document. I know that both you and the chairman hold your staffs to a very high uh, degree of perfection. Uh, I can tell you if that document came out of uh, of either of your staffs, uh, some heads would roll. You've both read it. Uh, it no longer provides the guidance. It no longer identifies the threat. It went three years without talking about methamphetamine at all when everybody, small towns to big cities in America, could pick up their, uh, their newspaper or turn on their local news and understand the threat posed by meth. Uh, there has been, uh, you know, Director, uh, or Deputy Director Scott Burns uh, has done a lot to try to coordinate with the Haida directors and has been very respectful. Uh, I just received a letter uh, as the President of the National Narcotic Officers Coalition from uh, Director Walters 
uh, where he uh, reminded me that I had helped participate in the development of the National Synthetic Drug Strategy and the National Drug Control Strategy. Well, I can tell you that two years ago, I sent a letter asking him to please take our name off the National Drug Control Strategy because not only did we not think it was an effective document, we had never participated in, in writing it. I have never once, nor my organization, been asked to consult since Director Walters has been there on any of the policy documents that have come out of the shop, despite the fact that it is my members that are out doing the job every single day on the ground. Uh, there is absolutely no coordination. There is an arrogance within that organization that prohibits them philosophically from talking to the cops that do the job on the street. Uh, that hasn't always been that way at ONDCP, but it has been that way uh, since Director Walters got there. And, and it is truly a shame to ignore the hundreds of thousands of years of experience that could come from bringing our organizations together uh, in discussing with the true drug warriors what's going on uh, in America. This is the last thing. Um, you know, I, I tell my staff, you're talking about staff, I tell my staff, let's spend 5% of our time um, figuring out the problem and figuring out the solution, but let's spend the rest of our time, the 95% doing the solution. Um, and, you know, I mean, what do you see? We, we had that amendment on the floor that said, I mean, which I thought was incredible, that said that there had to be consultation. I mean, I don't think you, it's kind of hard to legislate that kind of stuff, consultation between ONDCB and, and folks like you all. But I mean, what, what would you all like to see us do, if anything? I mean, uh, with regard to this issue of collaboration, and I'm sure that that's something that you consider very significant. And I, uh, and I was so glad that uh, statements were not made earlier in the earlier panel that this was just, uh, uh, just a turf battle. I didn't, you know, I think they, they realize that you, you are very sincere about what you're trying to do uh, and what you're doing. So the question is, how do we, I mean, what suggestions do you have for us? Well, well if I might, I mean, the first. To do the solution, to make it happen. The, the first suggestion I would have is to continue to do what you do because although this is probably not the way the system was designed, uh, your committee under the leadership of Chairman Souter and you, Mr. Cummings, has become de facto uh, the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, it's your support on the HIDA, uh, on, on justice funding, uh, and on a whole host of other things from drug-free schools and, and community anti-drug coalitions and drug courts uh, that has led the policy discussions in America. And so I think at least the members of, of, of my organization, our suggestion is to thank you for what you do and to ask you to continue to do it as long as that need and that void exists. Mm -hmm. All right, and again, yes, uh, yes, Mr. I think Donahue. one of the things that has to happen in the next year is that the law enforcement community has to be assured that there is some permanency in HIDA that is an organization where collaboration is the way to go in the future. We need to bring people together. We don't need to push them away. Mm -hmm. And I've been involved as a HIDA director for six years. There hasn't been a market increase in the funding in that six year time. I can tell you that costs are skyrocketing and the drug problem is not going away. We need additional funding to bring more of these organizations into this collaborative effort. Well, I hope that when you go back, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Sauter feels the same way, the last thing we want is for the morale of our, uh, of the, your employees to, to wane. I mean, that's the last thing we want. And certainly one of the easiest ways for that to happen is when people are uncertain about their jobs. They have to survive. They've got to do for their families. Um, and so I hope that you all will take the message back to them that we'll continue to fight with everything that we've got because we realize how important what you do is every, and what they do is to, to our nation. And again, we thank all of you. We really do for what you do. Thanks. I have a, have a few more um, follow-up questions. Um, Mr. Brooks, were you, did they talk to your organization about the new meth, 
border strategy that the Attorney General announced last week? No, sir. We have never been uh, consulted on any strategy or policy document uh, since Director Walters has been there. Anybody here consulted? Yeah, um, seen it. No. <clears throat> are you aware that that, that was a <clears throat> southwest border strategy focus um, and with Mexico? Are you aware that they're about to unveil another mess strategy? Yes. Uh, any of you consulted on that? No. No. How did you become aware that they were going to do it? Uh, we, we've heard discussions from uh, the Office of State and Local Affairs that this document is in process. And in fact, in Director Walter's letter to me, he told me that I had, in fact, consulted with him. But I, that, that's not true. I have not. My organization has not. The <clears throat> in De Detroit, Mr. Uh, Azam, um, when the the um, uh, big meth bust occurred there from Canada that took at that point 40 percent of the known precursor chemicals. Was your HIDA yes. involved in that with the EA? The, uh, the, the pseudoephedrine that was coming across, yes. that, that DEA is an important part of our HIDA, as are actually the Canadians as well. We, uh, we host the Canadians on a regular basis, uh, trade information and be effective. We have IBITs, ICATs, all the things that make that work well. And HIDA was, uh, two or three of our task forces worked on it. One of our funded task forces was instrumental out of Detroit, working with Chicago and the West Coast and the southern border in eliminating that problem. Our, uh, our operations in Detroit with DEA was also instrumental in working with the Canadian authorities to, to come up with the regulations which sort of stopped that. So even when there was something that was clearly national, through a HIDA, you were able to bring state Absolutely. and local. Because that's as are pure a national not, thing as there could be. Uh, hi, uh, everything national and international that occurs out there, I guarantee you one of our HIDAs has something to do with it. Our cases may begin small and become big. Uh, we make sure that there's a federal agent in every task force to be able to carry that investigation to its ultimate, including OCDF, including uh, whatever. And we have several international cases out of Detroit, and I know Chicago has, and the border has as well. Because you're on the international border directly, do you have any ICE and CBP people in your HIDA? I do. I have two ICE agents. Uh, however, we used to have five, but because of the turmoil, the, they withdrew three of them. Do you see? We have CBP as well, and we have hmm. Canadian Customs that comes do you, to visit. Do you right see now. some backing up of DHS from their commitment to the narcotics, or? Uh, what do you think is behind some of the production? Uh, I, I think it's, it's their other uh, uh, priorities that have been mandated upon them. Uh, they were gracious enough to leave two agents there, which means they still have a presence. And I'm sure if they get additional personnel, they'll, they'll bring it back up. Mr. Brooks, in the Northern California HIDA, uh, clearly we've had a number of problems with the Forest Service and so on. Do you have Forest Service people involved in your HIDA? Who would, what would be some of the other agencies that would be involved there? And also being from the <clears throat> California on the southwest border, uh, do you see CBP and ICE people there? Um, it, to the Forest Service, uh, we do not have as a direct component of our HIDA. However, we work uh, our marijuana team and, and DEA's DCEP teams uh, and our state uh, campaign against marijuana planting team, which our Intel Center and Technology Center support, uh, work very closely with the Forest Service, BLM, uh, and other federal components. We do a lot of major uh, open uh, space, uh, public land grows, some in the 70, 80, 90,000 plant uh, range, mostly uh, being operated by polydrug uh, Mexican national drug trafficking organizations. Um, as to ICE and CBP, uh, on the southwest border, there is some involvement in the San Diego partnership of the southwest border, HIDA. Uh, we, do, uh, we have an ICE uh, money laundering initiative in our HIDA. Uh, but as you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, from, from the position of our group, not my HIDA, we have been concerned that there has not been enough coordination from the DHS counter narcotic officer. I, I'm hoping with the appointment of uh, Mr. Dillon that we may see better coordination. But, I'm, but from our organization, uh, we strongly believe that the DHS role in counter narcotic operations has been degrading and, and, and has declined significantly. Do you <clears throat> and I, I doubt if any of you feel moving it to the Department of Justice would strengthen that. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, Opposite. That um, do you? Any, how many of you have some kind of Treasury presence uh, or money laundering in your hiders? 
How do you feel they would respond to being under the Department of Justice? They would respond as they did historically. They would go do their thing and leave us to our justice operations, as would our state and local partners probably, many of them. Well, that's the type of substantive type input that seems to be absent uh, in the discussions. And I appreciate your, your willingness to come and to put uh, this on the table, as you heard me say earlier, uh, I just I can't believe that they not only are uh, that they have any. The, the big battle was was last year. Uh, I mean, we had to convince the appropriators and other. But now it's like, why why are you continuing to pursue this? Uh, that we have to stay vigilant with it. I, I think that uh, we will prevail. I think the bipartisanship with it means that that will prevail. Uh, but it has been an incredibly uh, frustrating process, particularly when you have something that, in the anti-drug efforts, this kind of thing ebbs and flows, and you've, you've all seen this. I mean, we charge over and do drugs for, like, not do drugs, but do anti-drug enforcement for two, two or three years, and then we'll be off to something else, and then it'll come back up. In this case, everybody's begging to have more HIDAs, and it's like a punishment that the more HIDAs there are, the more determined they become to eliminate the HIDAs. It's like a, a backwards, uh, I mean, I, I, politically, I, I don't understand it. Usually, uh, when you have this much demand for a program, every, uh, well, maybe to some degree, the uh, Department of Justice does want to steal it, but at the same time, you would, you would think that there'd be a different attitude on funding and that we'd be looking how to expand the program, now how to freeze and cut. One last thing is this has to be uh, a relatively unique event in the annals of Congress, and that is you all just gave pretty strong opinions about how you feel about the current office of uh, the drug czar and about his lack of willingness to talk to you. At the same time, you're all asking that you stay there. If you want to know how bad this policy proposal is, to hear the frustration you all have with the agency you're in, and yet unanimously say, look, this isn't about us or about the individual. This is about the structure. You're worried about the structure and the long-term of your height is not just about the individual that was be sitting in the director's office. And that ought to be an incredibly strong message to the Congress to be that frustrated and yet wanting to stay uh, in that division and just get it uh, cleaned up. Mr. Davis, did you have any just yes, comments? Sir. Thank you, <laughs> Chairman. I just have one open-ended question and I guess about a one minute answer piece will put us in time to go and vote. And that is perhaps beginning with you, Mr. Brooks. How effective do you think we're really being relative to keeping the supply of, of, of drugs down? Uh, if you're talking about uh, the supply of drugs from coming outside this nation, I don't think we're being very effective. Uh, there is an endless supply of drugs within the United States none of which uh, comes from within the U.S. except domestic cannabis and some amount of marijuana. But even that is controlled with precursors from outside the U.S. Uh, that is why uh, drug enforcement, state and local drug enforcement is so critical. State and local officers make 97 percent of all drug arrests in America. And when you talk to the DEA, candidly, they'll tell you that the other 3 percent that they're responsible for came as part of a cooperative effort from leads provided to them in task force settings like the Hyder or Burn task forces uh, from state and local law enforcement. Mr. Carr? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I can tell you this much, that our program sees $10.5 billion, and that's a, that's a conservative estimate in 2004, which tells me that the national estimates that we've been suffering with for I don't know how many years are, have been off. If our program sees that much, our national estimates have been off. And I think a policy shop like ONDCP should be responsible for getting us solid drug estimates. And that's one, uh, another area I think they've really uh, been amiss on. They've fallen short of doing that. Have we been successful? I think we've been successful. Uh, I think it's uh, something's hard to major, hard to get your arms around. However, I hate to think of how bad a position we'd be in if we hadn't been doing as well as we've been doing. How bad would the streets be then? How bad would the meth problem be if it hadn't been for programs such as ours and the hard 
hard work and dedication of law enforcement and prevention and treatment folks. Donahue. Uh, Congressman, uh, without the Haida in Chicago, we'd be lost. I can tell you that over the last five years, the amounts of assets and drugs that are seized has gone up dramatically. It's tripled since 2000. Uh, and the reason is, is because of the strengthening relationships between the state, federal, and local agencies. Uh, the only thing that has kind of been a bump in the road has been the proposals that have come out of the administration that have kind of taken the footing away from Haida. Sir, I, I, I look to what we did with uh, the methamphetamine labs in Michigan, and I think back to the question that Congressman Watson asked. We had a situation in Michigan seven years ago where sheriffs were pointing fingers at the state police and the state police were pointing at the feds. You take care of our meth problem. Haida came in, brought them together, and again, coordinating, synchronizing, put together a very effective operation. We haven't conquered it, but last year we had 183 labs, and I think that's 10 or 12 or 25 less than a year before. So we haven't won, but we've kept it somewhat, somewhat in a reasonable fashion. And it reminds me of that lawn of mine at home. I have to cut it every week, whether I want to or not, sir. <laughs> Mr. Burt. In my 30-some uh, years in law enforcement, the one thing I've found is that uh, measuring prevention uh, is probably the most difficult thing you can do. And I have to agree with whoever said it. I think that uh, is there a substantial amount of drugs in our region? Absolutely. Um, we have 20-year-olds um, that are selling kilos of cocaine, uh, being able to buy $20,000 worth and sell these uh, tells me that the supply is plentiful, again, from Mexico. But I think that we're making some significant progress in some of the cases we've done and these drug uh, operations, cartels that we've been able to dismantle, I think have been highly effective. I think, as I, someone else said, I don't know what would have happened had we not done that. So I guess the answer is yes, I think it is working, and I, I would hate to see what the, uh, what the outcome would be if we're not doing this. Thank you, gentlemen, very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, have, have any of the others of you, other than uh, Mr. Donahue, seen fentanyl? Uh, that, the, the, it, the heroin, the fentanyl, you've seen it in Detroit as well? We, we had a terrible situation uh, this weekend. We had uh, 12 overdose deaths of heroin and fentanyl in the Detroit area in 24 hours. And I believe since then we've had eight more. Uh, wow. It's a terrible thing. Since uh, I think uh, September or October, we've had a, about 120 deaths. It's a, it's a major operation going back there as we speak uh, in that regard. CDC came in from Atlanta on Monday to examine the situation. The Drug Enforcement Administration has been on it since last fall. We put out public, uh, public notices to be careful, and uh, we suspect uh, that, uh, it, as Mr. Donahue points out, they haven't figured out that this fentanyl is a terribly killing drug. Except my staff gave me a note. This is what the Russian special forces used against the Chechen terrorists. Uh, fentanyl. Sure. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, it's also been found in Philadelphia too. Because uh, it, it, a few years ago we had this <clears throat> rash of heroin overdoses in Dallas and in uh, a few other places, and we focused on. But I wasn't familiar with this. We'll follow up to to try to get uh, some more uh, specific data. Once again, let me thank you all for your leadership. Um, I'm very frustrated by this intelligence stovepiping, even within the narcotics area, but uh, Mr. Azem, uh, particularly in the Detroit area, the, the one model we have that's great is New York City because they were forced to deal with it. And there you see the Haida integrated with the Homeland Security. Yes. And, and the fact is, is that in the Detroit metropolitan area, as well as in the Buffalo area, we have huge Arab American populations. Yes, and it spills down into my district in northeastern Indiana Sure. most of whom are hardworking, dedicated Americans, right. but they're communities within which to hide. And if there's any place we ought to be looking at, at how to integrate the intelligence agencies that we have and the movement, it is uh, a lot on the north border right now. Yes, uh, and it, it's just incredible to me that, that even though they have the New York City model, it hasn't been something that's looked at uh, across the board. I don't want to dim diminish the narcotics by getting it too entangled in the Homeland Security, but it is a, 
a real challenge. Mr. Chairman, I'm a strong proponent that if you're doing a good job of anti-drug work, you're going to do an excellent job of anti-terrorism work. I believe uh, I mentioned at, at the hearings you had in Detroit a couple years ago. The, the important thing is that the HIDA program, because of its nature, coordinating, synchronizing, has made itself available through all its resources to both the City of Detroit Department of Emergency Management Fusion Center as well as the one that the state is putting up. As a matter of fact, Thursday we're having some meetings because our executive board has said this HIDA will participate with you. We haven't waited for any instructions from Washington, none of my colleagues have either. We've just come forward and said our ISCs are available and will work well with your fusion centers on anti-terrorism work as well as anti-drug work. We're having, in the Homeland Security, we're having the problem that each division of Homeland Security wants to have its own stovepipe operation. We're having enough trouble exactly. inside it, yet alone getting together with you guys. But thank you for bringing these things to our attention. Thank you for your commitment. Please lay back, as Mr. Cummings said, to all the people who work in your agencies, how much we appreciate their efforts. Thank you. With that, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, sir. In today's immigration debate, the Senate approved an amendment that would double the fines on employers that hire illegal immigrants and require employers to check the legal status of new hires.